ensuring educational excellence, we challenge yes. and inspire all learners to positively impact their work. That was great. Welcome everyone. Hello, good evening, and thank you all for joining us. This is the Birmingham Public School Board of Education, our regular meeting for the month of August. Yes, August 2020. Uh, my name is Kim Whitman, and it's my privilege to serve the community as our Board of Education President for the 2020-2021 school year. Uh, today is Tuesday, August 18th, and as I mentioned, this is our regular meeting for the month of, of August. Again, welcome, and for all of those of you watching, um, thanks for joining us on our YouTube channel. Uh, today's agenda, we're gonna start right in with the superintendent's report, which will include Mark giving us some pretty important updates on both the COVID-19 data report, as well as giving us an update on our virtual return to school plan. Um, after Mark's update, we're gonna move into board comments and then transition into public communication, where we have eight public comment submissions. Um, after that, we will then move into approval of our consent agenda. And then this evening, we actually only have two resolutions of which we'll discuss and vote upon. Uh, the first order of business is roll call. And Mark, I'll ask it uh, to turn it over to you to please take roll. Thank you, President Whitman. Uh, Trustee McKinney? Here. Trustee Whitman? Present. Trustee Ashlooney? Present. Trustee Young. Present. Trustee Hokemer. Present. Trustee Rass. Here. Trustee Jennings. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Six, uh, six oh. trustees present. Got it. Thank you. Trustee, Trustee Jennings is on his way. He was just having a little bit of technical difficulty, so he'll check in as soon as he pops up. Perfect. Sure. Um, and before we turn it over to the superintendent's report, trustees, I will ask, do we have any additions or deletions to this, this evening's agenda? No? Okay, seeing none, Mark, I will turn it over to you, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Whitman, uh, trustees of the Board of Education. Uh, thanks for, uh, for joining us this evening. And a thank you to Dr. Omar Hakim, new principal at uh, BCS. Uh, for serving as our mission statement reader for uh, today's meeting here on August 18th. I have two, uh, two items that I'd like to share with the Board of Education uh, tonight. Uh, one is a uh, response to uh, your, uh, your request from the last meeting to uh, share with both you and the public uh, some of the data points that we're looking at and we've been looking at for some time with respect to uh, COVID-19 and uh, its, its uh, impact on Birmingham uh, public schools and really all schools in, in Oakland County uh, for that matter. Uh, and then the second uh, portion of the superintendent's report for uh, this evening uh, involves uh, just updates on our return to school plan. Uh, we have some additional schedules that we'd like to share with you and with the public for, for this evening. And during that report, it's likely I'll call on several of the other, during that aspect of the report, it's likely I will call on uh, a few other members of the central leadership team to, to provide a little information about some of the, some of the items we've been working on uh, since, uh, since last week. Can everybody see my, see my screen okay? Okay, wonderful. Uh, and uh, uh, so I'd like to start by uh, just sharing, first of all, kind of an overview of some of the metrics uh, that we're gonna be, uh, I'll be sharing with you tonight. Uh, and these, these are items that we've been looking at for some time. Uh, we haven't put them in one place for uh, all of you, nor have we shared these with the public at this point in time. So pursuant to your request at the last study session, I wanted to make sure this information was available to you. Uh, and in the PDF that we have up, uploaded to the board book site uh, that the public is able to see. So if you go to the uh, board book site, uh, we did add this to it. All of these links uh, are, are hot. So anybody that views that PDF, can click on them and then you can actually see the source documents for all the information. I wanted to make sure that you and anyone in the community that wanted to go and, and look at these on a regular basis, uh, you could go to this presentation and, um, and find that source information. Uh, and I also wanted to let you know that we plan on uh, putting this PowerPoint on the, on the website following this, uh, following this presentation. 
Uh, so what we'll, we'll talk about, and I will move through this pretty quickly. I would encourage uh, trustees, I'm gonna be looking at the, at the presentation over here on the side of my, on my other screen. If you have any questions, please unmute uh, and interrupt me. Uh, or if you have any, any uh, comments that you'd like to make uh, about the sources of data, uh, please feel free to jump in. It's probably easiest. Uh, there are a lot of slides, um, but it, each slide really just conveys kind of a snapshot of data for that particular, uh, that particular uh, source uh, and, and type, of, uh, type of data. So it's probably best if you just interrupt and, and holler. And I can't see you raising your hand, so just unmute and, and jump in. So I'd like to start by just uh, sharing, first of all, the seven-day Oakland County uh, case average. This is a seven-day trailing average of new cases confirmed uh, in Oakland County. Uh, we'll also uh, share the uh, seven-day Oakland County uh, case average. This is an overall uh, average by DPS uh, zip code. You can go to that Oakland County site and drill down by zip code. Uh, we'll take a look at uh, the 14-day Oakland County trend graph uh, in graphical form, just the trend in the last two weeks. Uh, the New York Times has a good has a good presentation of that. Then we'll look at three uh, uh, three items uh, related to the infection itself, uh, the infection rate in Oakland County, the positive test rate in Oakland County, Oakland County cases by age group. All of these uh, all these bits of information, including the the three that I described previously are all updated as of Monday, August 17th. So we don't have today's information there, but all this reflects information uh, at the end of the day on, on Monday, August 17th. Uh, I'll share one slide that just captures what our surrounding counties are experiencing with respect to um, uh, the recent seven day statistics. Uh, and, uh, and then we'll get into some additional information I'd like to share with you and I'm hoping to get some feedback at the end of this portion of the presentation. Uh, the first is I'd like to take a look at our, our phase four state of Michigan roadmap that really has served as our foundation uh, for decisions related to potentially opening school uh, in any variety of forms for the fall of 2020. Uh, and uh, I wanna compare the information that's included in the Michigan uh, uh, return to school roadmap for phase four and the descriptions related to COVID-19 and the conditions of COVID-19 that anchor the, um, the information that's in that document as it was provided by the state on June 30th. And then we're gonna compare that with information from a variety of different sources, uh, uh, report, uh, decision-making uh, thresholds for the state of Oregon, state of Pennsylvania, uh, and, uh, and Massachusetts. Uh, and then um, I wanna mention here, but we, I won't go through them, we are also looking at fall of 2020 uh, return to school issues. We share those with the public before in communications, school districts uh, across the country that have already started school and have had to make significant changes in their, in their plans and how they've, uh, how they've provided schooling based on COVID onsets uh, in their schools or across the district. Uh, we've already mentioned situations in Mississippi, Georgia, and Indiana. Um, some of you may, uh, uh, if you if you watch, tune into the news in the last 24 hours, the University of North Carolina uh, was was back. They were back for just a few days. Uh, there were a couple of outbreaks and spreads there. They have decided uh, to uh, cancel their in-person classes for the entirety of the uh, entirety of the semester, and they're going completely online for the remainder of this semester based on uh, those experiences they they've had just a couple of days into school. So I, I mentioned I mentioned that here. I won't go through those in detail because we've already shared those with the community, and I know that you're aware of those. But I did want to bring to your attention that most recent uh, uh, change in uh, uh, change in uh, you know how how the University of North Carolina is is. Uh, uh, how they've made some decisions with respect to outbreaks. And then finally, a tool that we uh, uh, were looking at at the end of July and going into August, it's a University of Texas COVID predictor uh, for schools. Uh, this information I, I do wanna share with you is not updated. The latest information we have dates back to July 31st. And I have a couple of graphics from that report uh, that, I can, that I can share with you. Um, the first thing I'd like to do uh, in this uh, next slide is, is explain some of the heat maps. I want to put in context what's happening around the country, in our state, and in our county uh, before we get into some of the seven-day trailing averages or the seven-day averages uh, for our county. Uh, and so the maps that we're going to show you here, just to provide some context for, for the United States and for the state of Michigan, are, are based on um, uh, maps and in, in the colors provided by the Harvard Global Health Institute. They have established uh, a COVID risk level 
uh, that's really founded on, uh, it, uh, it's founded on the seven day trailing average of new confirmed cases uh, for, uh, for states and for counties. Uh, uh, and and they, they take that and then turn that number into a, an amount per 100,000 residents uh, and come up with a number here. So if there are more than 25 new confirmed cases on the seven day trailing average for 100,000 uh, people, uh, they assign a red level to that, a red risk level. The orange is anywhere from 10 to 25 new confirmed cases per 100,000 people. A yellow risk level indicates uh, a one to 10 new cases for 100,000 people. And the green is less than one. Uh, and the green, as you can imagine, that's a, that's a good sign. That means that um, the uh, COVID has been successfully suppressed or it's non, uh, nearly non-existent. Uh, in that particular county, so this is this is the framework for this for the state uh, state maps that uh, in the in the country maps that you're going to see right now. So you can see right here in the national context, just taking a look at the colors according to that uh, Harvard Global Health Institute um, uh, risk level. Uh, this is broken out by county, and it just really gives you a snapshot of the entire country right now. Uh, the red areas are ones where they're seeing um, significant increases in the last week in new cases per 100,000 people. If it's green, it means again that there's either been a reduction to get to that point or uh, cases have not been uh, present significantly uh, in, those, uh, in those areas. Uh, the next thing I wanted to bring to your attention, something that we've been watching, the state of Michigan has a dashboard uh, and uh, you, can, you can find this at the michigan.gov site. Uh, and I, I just want to bring this to your attention uh, as well. This is something that we watch pretty regularly. It provides cumulative information on total cases uh, and, and deaths in the state of Michigan. And you can drill down to the county level uh, in, this, uh, in this particular dashboard. Uh, and and that's, that's what um, ground some of the information you're going to see uh, later in the presentation. If you just take a look at uh, the state to try to understand the context of the state here, you're seeing most of the state of Michigan Michigan in this, in this slide uh, in yellow at this point in time with a few counties in orange, green, uh, and red according to that risk level. And again, just this just paints a picture for what's happening across our country relative to those, the, the Harvard risk level uh, and what's happening in our, in our state. We've also been taking a look at what's happening in our, in our county. This picture is taken directly from the uh, county level uh, uh, COVID website where you can get county level, county level data. Uh, while the uh, uh, the data that's described here represents new cases in the last 30 days. Uh, uh, and there's a factor here that's the cases in the last 30 days per 10,000 people. Uh, you still get a picture here because if it's a, if it's a dark blue color, you know that there's a significant uh, presence of, of COVID and potentially spread. The lighter the color, uh, the better that particular uh, area is within Oakland County. Uh, this is a seven-day Oakland County uh, case average over time, uh, dating back to the month of March, uh, and uh, now again updated as of uh, as of yesterday. This is the seven-day trailing average on the particular day uh, of this chart. So you can see uh, where where we were headed in March was a significant spike in conjunction with the closure of school. Uh, uh, when the when the state went into a significant lockdown, those cases dropped. And you can see here the increases uh, that occurred over the over the course of the summer, uh, and where we're at here in the last few days. A, a slight increase since July ended, uh, with a with a decrease today. I, or I'm sorry, yesterday. I don't have today's uh, statistics um, in this graph. Uh, I'm told that there was another decrease, which is good news. Um, and this this uh, portion of it right here, you see. I want to just point out uh, here this 10.8 number. That's the seven day trailing or the moving average uh, basically takes a look at the average number of confirmed cases in the last seven days in Oakland County. And our average right now is, is 10.8. You're going to see that number compared to um, uh, other counties in Michigan uh, and thresholds that other states uh, have established for thinking about returning to school. Uh, and so I want to make sure that you're, you're aware of that number there, that 10.8. The daily new cases right here, uh, 135.9. Um, Again, this is a this is a moving average. This is just total daily new cases. What I do want to point out now that that number there is right around 136. 
uh, when, when we were starting these discussions about potentially returning to school in July and late August, uh, that number was a little bit, uh, a little bit lower. It was just under 100, right around 96, 98 to 100 uh, on, those, on those, particular, uh, those particular days. So we have increased um, since, the, since the end of July. At the Oakland County level site, you can drill down a little bit farther and take a look by zip code. Um, this uh, unfortunately doesn't represent the seven day trailing average. It represents the uh, new cases in the last 30 days. The color that's assigned here in this map uh, just shows again, it's a, it's a number that's calculated based on a residence uh, in the zip code per 10,000 people. Again, the darker it is, it means it's more significant uh, presence of COVID uh, as confirmed in those particular zip codes. On the right-hand side there, I wanted to make sure that uh, you had some, some sense of what these numbers meant relative to the um, 100,000 number, the seven-day trailing average per 100,000 people uh, that I shared earlier. That's the 10.8. Uh, this doesn't relay any seven-day trailing average information. So you can see the zip code there on the left. The, the municipality is in the second column. The third column represents the 30-day case count per 100,000 people. And then uh, to create some meaning in that, we just uh, took that number in the third column, divided it by four, so you could get basically a four week average. This is an overall average, it's not a trailing average. All the other statistics that you saw um, um, earlier were seven day trailing averages, which represents again, the most recent seven days. Uh, this doesn't capture it, it just captures the overall four week average. But again, just trying to, trying to create some some relative uh, meaning here. The numbers don't mean the same thing, but you can actually you can put them in context relative to where the whole county currently is at, uh, with a number of 10.8 per 100,000 people. Uh, this slide here just shows the uh, Oakland County 14-day trend. This is taken from the New York Times. Again, as of yesterday, uh, the 11 cases per 100,000. That just rounded up from the 10.8. I wanted to put this in there because you can neatly see the 14 day trend that shows an increase over the course of the last two weeks. Uh, and it's very likely when you see the numbers put in from today, uh, again, I was, um, uh, I'm pretty sure that number is gonna show a little bit of a tail dropping just a tad uh, for, the last, uh, for the last two weeks. So hopefully we can turn that around and, uh, and, and get that moving in the right, in the right direction. Uh, just so you can understand some additional information about in infection rates in the state of, uh, state of Michigan right now, um, uh, this is from a uh, website called COVID Act Now. Uh, it is a, uh, it's essentially a, a think tank that's comprised of um, uh, business leaders, some technology officers. It's, uh, it, there's a partnership with the uh, uh, Georgetown um, Medical Department uh, as well as uh, Stanford University. Uh, and they're, they're also providing information with respect to infection rates, and they have some, some pretty nifty uh, graphs here, too. So you can see, I wanted to show you, uh, just to put it in context, I've got some county-level information later on in the presentation. This is the infection rate right now. It's at 1.04 overall in the state of Michigan, and it means uh, uh, that on average, each person in, person in Michigan with COVID is infecting 1.04 other individuals. So it just means that COVID continues to spread, but it is in a slow and controlled fashion right now, according to, uh, according to that site. The only thing that I wanted to point out here is just a slight, slight increase uh, over the last, uh, last few days. The next graph is, is, is from the same website, uh, COVID Act Now, but it uh, indicates the positive test rate. Right now in the state of Michigan, uh, we're at 2.6% according to this, uh, this site. Uh, and um, the reason why I wanted to share this with you is other, other countries that have already opened school and they've done so and have experienced some relative success, uh, the positive test rate uh, is 3% uh, or less uh, in, those, in those particular uh, countries. Uh, and, and again, this will have a little bit more meaning later on in the presentation. I've got an international comparison of that um, seven-day trailing average for every 100,000 people. And so you can, you can take a look at this right now in the state of Michigan and this in the county later on uh, relative to what some other countries have, uh, have done. Hey, Mark? Yes. Mark, just quick question. So... Um, a lot of other sites show Michigan's positive rate to still be over three. Do you know 
where they're getting their data compared to other reporting agencies? Yeah, so a, a lot of this, uh, a lot of this information is coming from the New York Times reports that go back to local health departments as they're as they're reported. Okay. Um, if you go to this, yeah, if you go to this website, I, I looked at it before I presented this. I I, um, I had heard of this site and had seen some of the graphs, but I I, I really didn't un I didn't have a firm understanding of the you know the veracity of the organization or what it was putting out. Um, the New York Times stuff so far has been pretty has been pretty. Uh, pretty accurate. And those numbers jive with the New York Times numbers jive with what we're seeing in the Oakland, uh, in Oakland County. So I can't explain why that why that difference exists now from a state standpoint, but I do know most of their information is rooted in the New York Times. And you can go there, there's actually a data presentation that they have on this website, uh, where they they explain item by item where where the data uh, does come from. Yeah, I just, in my experience, when I was trying to pull data, there was a little lag. Um, in some of the data that I was finding. So I was wondering if that might be a reason why it's different. Um, also, I know that in the governor's press conference last week, um, they reported a slightly lower positive test rate for Detroit versus Oakland and Macomb County. So I don't know if that would factor into it as well or not. It, it very well could. I mean, this data is as good as as the institutions and the agencies that are reporting it, uh, and it's frequently updated. So, it could be the case that a, a particular, um, uh, you know, department, uh, you know, they may submit information at various times, you know, during the day, uh, and so it comes in sporadically. I do know that there's been some interesting uh, trends in the data as reported after weekends. Um, so you'll see these spikes on Monday uh, because it's typically not updated on the weekend. So. Um, that could that could very well be the case. One thing that I do want to say about the positive test rate, um, I I was on a call yesterday with uh, Dr. Pranav uh, Kathari. He is the head of uh, the COVID response, the entire COVID response for all of the uh, rock, the companies of rock related to Amrock, Rock Financial. He's heading up their entire response. Uh, I was on that call with uh, some administrator from the super, uh, with the superintendent of uh, Bloomfield Hills and. Uh, in a couple of their, a uh, few of their other administrators. And he was saying that this positive test rate, I mean, this 3%, the, the meaning that one can derive from this, um, you really have to put it in context with what's happening in a particular community. Um, you know, you can you can test a lot of, obviously if you test test more people, your odds are that you're gonna have, um, you know, more, more cases. You could have a really high rate, which means you've got a significant problem in a particular area. You could have a high rate, which means that you're testing a lot of people. You're not, you're identifying people that have the disease, so you're successfully finding those. Uh, and if you can quarantine those individuals, this would hopefully drop over time. So um, he he kind of cautioned us to 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 really think carefully about applying meaning to this. But he did confirm that that overall, you want to see this number again below that three percent because it means that uh, whatever mitigation or suppression. Um, methods are being, uh, you know, recommended by a local health department with respect to quarantining. Um, it, it's, that's, a, that's a good sign that they're testing a lot of people and, and the test results are coming back uh, negative because it's not spreading within a community. Uh, our, uh, the next slide here uh, is uh, taken from the county site. Uh, it breaks down the, um, uh, COVID confirmed cases by age group. And this really is just a summary for Oakland County uh, since, the, uh, since the onset of, of COVID in the county. And I, I juxtapose that graph, that bar graph uh, with, uh, this is a, a county graph that was published. Uh, this is about a week ago. I think that ends around August 8th or August 7th. And you can see um, down at the bottom there, that the, the brightest blue, that sky blue color at the very bottom of that graph on the right hand side, you can see the percentage of cases in zero to 19 year olds increase. And I, and I know we've, we've talked about that in the, in the past. There have been several media reports about, um, about new cases coming in with, uh, uh, with, with, you know, with kids in that age group, uh, which obviously is our, our specific, uh, you know, our clientele. So that's something we've been taking a look at as well. Um, you know, based on some of those some of those reports. Again, this is available on the county uh, the county uh, a website at any at any day. Um, just to just to put the um, 
some of the infection rate and positivity rate test rate uh, in uh, in more a more of a local context. Uh, this is again from the same site that focuses uh, on Oakland County. Uh, and um, you can see those daily new cases, it's around 11. So that's consistent with the 10.8 that was reported um, uh, on that county graph that I had earlier. And the 11 is reported by the New York Times. This is 11 also. The infection rate uh, is 1.1 here. So overall for the state as reported was 1.04. This is 1.1, slightly higher. Uh, and you, you can see, if you remember back on that graph, this, this graph kind of uh, mirrors or it's analogous with that state um, state inf infection rate. I'm going to click over, Trustee Holcomber, you asked about the positivity rate. Um, but you can see here in Oakland County, it's 4.4%, uh, uh, much higher as reported here compared to the state. So this is the local positive test rate um, and, you know, higher than the 3% threshold. But, um, you know, but as they're indicating here, it indicates adequate, adequate testing in the county uh, at, a, at a little higher rate. I did want to share with you some other things. We're paying attention to counties around us, and we've been we've been monitoring this. This is from the COVID Act Now site. You can get the same information from the New York Times site, and also through the Michigan.gov site. And I, I I arranged this. I just wanted to show you at the top here. You've got Macomb, Livingston, and Lapeer counties that are in the red category right now, um, where where there's there's more significant um, uh, outbreak uh, in concern. Uh, this is from the COVID Act Now site, and then you have down on the bottom, Wayne, Genesee, and Washtenaw. Some of these are not neighbors, but they're nearby, um, where, uh, where they, they're in that yellow category. Uh, and I think COVID Act Now had us in the orange, uh, in the orange category. Uh, and then one of the final um, reports that we've been looking at, this is a report that was published on July 31st. I shared this earlier. Uh, it was, it was, uh, the study was published by researchers at the University of Texas. And what they were, what they were able to do is there were some assumptions in the, in the research. So they were assuming that a COVID case would be spread to a certain number of individuals. Um, uh, and you can, you can actually go into, from the New York Times site, you can go in and see all the assumptions that were, um, that were part of this study. Uh, but based on the size of school, uh, they, they, uh, they were, uh, Proposing that you could you could basically determine based on that size of school what would the probability be of a, of a positive uh, COVID uh, uh, infected person coming into the building based on various sizes. So the the graphic on the left shows if a school only had a hundred a uh, hundred students uh, in staff uh, that right there it's showing that there would there is an estimate right there that with only a hundred there would be zero. Um, COVID cases coming into the school within the first week. That's just within the first week based on the statistics for that particular county uh, at the time that that report was issued. On the right-hand side, that graphic shows, okay, if you now have more students uh, in a particular county in a building, you know, what is what are the odds in that first week that someone's going to enter that facility uh, infected with COVID? And for Oakland County, uh, that was one person would be expected to arrive infected at a school with 500 people in the first weeks. So, you know, based on what we were proposing before, uh, it's likely that our high schools, uh, uh, even if you took out the Birmingham Virtual Academy students, by dividing them in half, it's likely that we'd have close to around 500, uh, 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 you know, 500 in a, in a building at our high schools. It would be unlikely at our middle schools and elementary schools. Uh, this is something, again, that was informing our informing our thinking. So all, all that really just represents, uh, you know, people have asked me in emails, and I know uh, 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 many of you asked at the last study session, you know, what are you looking at to try to create some meaning uh, around what, what COVID is doing in the county and how it impacts our thinking? The, the, you know, these are all the, uh, this is all the information that we, we've been looking at. Um, now I want to go on to the, to the next part of the presentation. So how do we make meaning out of this? And in the in the in the call uh, yesterday with uh, Dr. Kathari, we really spent some time digesting the Harvard Global Health Institute's COVID risk levels, uh, and there's a six-page paper that they have published for policymakers in order to help to help uh, help policymakers uh, help administrators with decision making uh, with respect to COVID outbreaks in their particular area. Um, I, I won't go through the, the levels again because we talked about that last time again. Uh, they're, they're all based on the number of new confirmed cases in a seven-day trailing average per 100,000 people. 
What I do want to point out now is that Oakland County is in the orange category for accelerated spread. Uh, that spans 10 to 24 cases per 100,000 people. Uh, and for, com for comparison, I pulled out the, um, the graph from the New York Times that had the 14-day trend. So you could see in comparison, it's 11 per 100,000 here. So you know where we're at compared to this, again, this wide span here uh, in 10 to 24 with accelerated spread. What I do want to point out in the orange category is that um, uh, Harvard is included in the description of, of COVID cases with an orange category is that, you know, the stay at home orders could, could possibly be uh, in order depending on, you know, what that number is in that category. Uh, and then they're recommending rigorous test and trace programs uh, be implemented. Uh, those test and trace programs are being implemented by the county right now. Uh, that's, that's one thing that in the, in the cases that we've had in Birmingham Public Schools so far, we've worked collaboratively with them uh, and, uh, and, it, and they've, uh, from, from, what we, uh, from what we've been able to experience so far, that's something that, that uh, we've collaborated very well with them on and, and, and they have been able to share information with people and advise, advise them appropriately and advise us with respect to our decision making based on those individual cases and also our communication based on those individual cases. What we're not, um, what I want to be really transparent about right now is what we're not hearing from Oakland County, from the health department, or from the state at this point in time is okay. Given this, um, you know, given these, uh, this span of new confirmed cases on a seven-day average ratio that we're looking at right now, uh, what? How do, how do we take that information and turn it into an actionable, hey, we have this amount right now, so we should take this particular course of action. Um, in particular, we don't have that right now from, from the state, and I'll show you the information that we have from the state uh, in comparison to some other states so you can see that. So within this range here, we have, a, we have a variety of different options. The state allows us to come back all remote. The state allows us to come back in a hybrid format. The state allows us to come back in full every day. Of course, with respect to any of those, we need to make sure that a workplace or schools are, are properly um, safety outfitted with PPE and all the requirements and strong recommendations that are part of those plans. Uh, but within that, within that um, range, uh, we have wide latitude from a decision-making standpoint to decide what, uh, what, we, could, what we would potentially uh, do. The information that you see on the state of Michigan safe start plan and also in the state of Michigan return to school roadmap does not share information with respect to thresholds like you see on this screen right here. All, all it describes are conditions uh, that, that would prompt the state to identify one phase over another phase uh, from an overall state standpoint. If you look into the phase four Michigan return to school roadmap, you'll see this description with respect to the virus status. Um, I, won't, I won't read this to you. I just wanna share this with you because there's not any, again, there's not any information about new cases on a seven day trailing average per 100,000 uh, 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 people. And so we really don't have any, some people have uh, sent emails and asked, uh, you know, what's your trigger? What is a quantifiable measure that's going to going to force force you or drive your decision making with respect to coming back into school in any format? Uh, and right now, we've been relying on the overall state of Michigan information. This information is not available from the health department. It's not available at the state level. It's not available from the state level health department, and it's not available in the in the state uh, uh, safe start. Nor is it in the state return to school roadmap. Uh, so we're we're left to make decisions with respect to only. The, the phase status of the state of Michigan for our region or for the overall state at any, uh, at any, particular, at any particular time. So I wanna contrast this with some other states, again, just to try to put meaning around uh, the, our, our, uh, our decision-making up to this point uh, and what some, uh, in Michigan and what some other states have, have chosen to do. So the first comparison that I wanna share with you is what's happening right now in the state of Oregon. Uh, their, their framework, um, uh, uh, sp specifically has, uh, has ranges that are, are, are driving decisions on return to school. There are county level measures and there are state level measures. I highlighted the state metric because the state metric has to be met for three weeks in a row. So for three weeks in a row, there has to be a new case rate on a seven day trailing average of less than 10 per 100,000 in, in a population. That's gotta be met again for three weeks in a row and the test positivity has to be less, less than or equal to 5%. five percent. 
So um, the state's got to meet this metric. And then within each, each county, the county's got to meet uh, that metric along, uh, along with that. Um, and again, for comparison, I just want to let you know, again, over here on the right-hand side, and I've included our comparison for Oakland County on every single one of these state comparisons. So you can see right now we're at 11. So if, if we were in the state of Oregon right now, uh, we would not be returning to in-person instruction. We would be all remote uh, at, this, at this point in time. If you take a look at the uh, state of Massachusetts, they've got a color-coded metric uh, that um, unique to their state. Uh, the DESE expectation for learning model, that's the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. It's essentially a sub subcategory of their Department of Education. And you can see what they, what they have, um, the thresholds that have been set in the state of Massachusetts. So if they're in red, it's basically a, a, a ratio of eight, eight new cases per 100,000 people. And if you're there or greater, you're in remote. So if we were in the state of Massachusetts right now, uh, we would automatically be in a remote environment uh, with our, our 11. For, for oh, yellow- Barb, Just be, for clarification, um, is this a statewide mandate or it's by county within the state? This is state level, state level uh, guidance. So then I don't feel like we're comparing apples to oranges because our state data looks different than our county data, correct? Yeah, let me let me clarify that. I, I can pull that up by by the end of the by the end of this presentation. I'll make sure that I I have that for you. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I know these are state thresholds, but now what you're saying does the state in its entirety have to meet this threshold, or do the individual counties right. need need to meet these thresholds? Correct. Yeah, I'll I'll clarify that later on. I I believe it's state level guidance as applied to the county, uh, but I I I don't want to I don't want to respond in error. I'll make sure that I that we um, uh, that we get that for you. Mark, I, yes. I'm pretty sure these, even though it's the state setting the guideline, but it is a county by county average because most states recognize that what's happening in one county doesn't necessarily mean it's happening in two counties over. Yeah, thanks, Trustee Holcomer. And I'll, I'll I'll confirm that before um, bef before before we're done. I I I, I think I, I I think that's accurate as well. Um, and I won't read you the rest here. You can see how they've you know how they've uh, structured that right now. And then finally, I want to take a look at Pennsylvania. So um, uh, uh, there is again, this is guidance for the state, um, and these are decisions in the county. You can see level of community transmission uh, in the county. Uh, so if you're less than 10 at the top there, uh, it's a low level of transmission. And there are two metrics there, the positivity rate uh, and the incidence rate per 100,000 people. Uh, and uh, schools, uh, schools and counties have two choices there. You can be full in person uh, or in a, a blended learning model, which would essentially be a, a hybrid model there where you're a little bit of in person and you're online at a moderate level. You're, you're either one of two things based on your decision making there. You can be blended, which would be the hybrid or full remote. And then uh, they've labeled it as substantial. Anything over 100 cases per 100,000 people, um, it's, it's automatically full remote uh, for, for Pennsylvania. And then the final comparison I wanted to share uh, were just some uh, international results. So I pulled this from uh, a study that was done to inform policymakers in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, they actually summarized um, they summarized the new cases per 100. I'm sorry, the new cases in the seven-day trailing average uh, per 100,000 residents in these countries when decisions were made in these countries to to go back to school or reopen schools after a period of closure. Uh, and so our our county uh, numbers there are at the bottom. So you can see in Denmark it was 18.2. Um, uh, Germany 9.1, and I won't read the rest. So you can see again, the varying degrees of reopening schools uh, at, at these, uh, at these uh, you know, various countries as indicated in that, uh, in that report. So uh, the Harvard Global Health Institute does, does communicate a strategy for pandemic resilient teaching and learning. Um, based on the COVID risk level there uh, with 25, 10 to 25, one to 10 and less than one. 
based on the color. It really means red. Um, you're going to be remote for all, green. Uh, all, all schools can open. Uh, uh, things, are, things are looking pretty good. And then uh, they, they've stated in both orange and yellow, uh, there are decisions there that districts need to make. What's interesting about how they have uh, shared this information, uh, and, and I, what I want to point out to you is this doesn't mean that if you're in orange, everything that's in that in that box needs to you know needs to come back, so to speak, or come back in some form. What they what they do is have established a priority based on uh, uh, basically educational needs. So pre-K through five, in-person and special education services at, at, at grade levels. That's a that's a they're your first priority. Second priority is six through eight, and then the final priority would be students in nine through twelve. So. Um, Again, the, I, what I like about this thinking is, and, and Dr. Kathari confirmed it in uh, his, his presentation and just talking through this a little bit, um, in, instead of thinking about a framework that you overlay the entire system and do something for all, uh, you know, this presents the information a little differently uh, in that it establishes priorities uh, and districts within those ranges can make, again, can make educated decisions based on those, based on those priorities. So uh, when uh, Superintendent Watson and I from Bloomfield Hills were, were talking about this, we took, uh, we were thinking about taking this, this uh, information here, these categories that are, uh, that are defined by these really clear markers, uh, you know, that you can see here based on the numbers, but, but you can tell here in orange and yellow, you know, we're left to make some, some decisions on our own here, uh, even you know, Harvard Here's uh, this Global Health Institute is telling us that we need to do that. So we were, we were trying trying to think of okay, our, our decision making there in orange and yellow is really kind of kind of fuzzy. So what we wanted to do is take that information, and try to visualize it in a little different format. And and so uh, we uh, were able to have this graphic created where we've got red here on the right hand side where we're full remote, we've got green here on the far left side where we're full in person. Well, we've got this yellow and orange mix here, really, that goes from one to 24 cases per 100,000, which is a really wide variation there. And based on those priorities, you know, our thoughts are that our concentration on small groups, special education, perhaps one-on-one -on -one, uh, a student uh, education here uh, in, in orange uh, would be a priority. And then uh, uh, adding in this K through 12, like starting at kindergarten or working our way up to 12th grade, Thinking about any phased-in or hybrid approach to education for those uh, for those particular students. Again, it's just this information here, put in a little different format that kind of represents the you know the wide variety of decision making here that we that you know we're faced with. Um, again, with no thresholds right now uh, coming from the state of Michigan with respect to triggers or frameworks uh, in which to interpret data for uh, for ourselves. And so, um, you know, and just thinking about the future, you know, where do we head, head from here? We're of course going to continue to look at this, you know, look at the data that we, uh, that I just shared with you. Uh, this is all, you know, really, really good information and any new reports that come out. Um, we're also going to take a look at controllable factors. So for example, you know, once we, once we start the school year, and I'll, I will talk about this a little bit later in the presentation too. Once we start the school year, we'd like to start thinking, uh, uh, pretty soon about uh, how it is that we might think about, you know, one-on-one -on -one instruction for students who need it or are or doing something in small groups. We're gonna have to work with our teachers and provide a systemic approach for making that happen for, for all kids in a particular category who would need that type of instruction. Uh, but we can think about our controllable factors. These are things that are at our disposal, health and safety protocols, distancing and other things associated with that. These are all things in, in our control that we need to think about. Of course, we need to resp be responsive to governmental factors. Um, uh, uh, Trustee Holcomer shared with me earlier in the day a news a news article that came out was published by M Live today actually uh, that talked about some information from the health department saying that they're they're thinking about uh, creating some type of framework for schools relative to uh, uh, some of the COVID numbers. Uh, that information could potentially come to us within the next two weeks. I also know in a call last Thursday with the Oakland County Health Department, all superintendents in Oakland County were advised that the health department is creating a new dashboard uh, that would be available to superintendents uh, that, and that we can share that information with our, with our boards of education uh, and with the public. So we're waiting for that information as well. 
Uh, and, um, you know, we're going to continue. I'm going to uh, continue to meet weekly. We now have created in Oakland County with superintendent standing weekly calls with the health department uh, just to get an update uh, on the numbers and, and uh, in our on our, on our call, we were really pushing for some enhanced guidance with respect to interpreting those numbers and uh, and uh, uh, decision making factors to to think about. There are also local conditions. You know, what's the current performance of a virtual environment right now? Input from our stakeholders, all those things that are coming into us locally that are unique to Birmingham Public Schools. Uh, and again, as I stated earlier, you know, really thinking uh, thinking about in-person, one-on-one, small group uh, interventions for students that we could potentially think about, uh, you know, as, as soon as the school year starts and how we can maybe, uh, uh, you know, consider doing those apart from any framework that we might, um, you know, apply overall uh, to, the, to the school district and our, our decision-making with respect to how to, how to uh, come back. And then the final thing that I wanted to share, uh, share with you is, um, uh, one of the things that I would like to do since since, uh, since we started uh, talking about our return to school plans, even beyond our focus groups, uh, uh, on which we had uh, several members of the community, parents who were in um, the medical in the medical field, uh, including doctors that were part of those focus groups, our thought moving forward uh, as people have been reaching out, I had several emails after the last study session for people that wanted to play a role. Uh, you know, absent any guidance from the state of Michigan or the health department right now, uh, play a role in helping us interpret these numbers or providing additional information that may they, that may come their way uh, through their profession. And so, uh, I, I I'd like to get your feedback on potentially creating a health advisory board where we reach out uh, within the week uh, and ask for professionals, professional parents within our community that are in the medical field uh, to sit on an advisory board, meet regularly. Uh, talk about the statistics that we're seeing in the county and in the state, uh, and then and just have a discussion um, uh, with respect to protocols and um, what those figures mean, especially absent, uh, you know, again, any of the markers from the state. Then, of course, ongoing review and considerations, you know, with that health advisory committee. All of our committees and focus groups are still meeting, our instruction committee, our health and safety uh, meeting. Rachel uh, just had a meeting yesterday with a health and wellness group, and so those groups are continuing to meet. Uh, and of course, we committed in the resolution that was passed um, last week to our regular data review and decision making at the board level, which I'm certainly committed to um, making sure that we can provide you with all the information possible. And I just again wanted to recapture for you, you know, kind of this new thinking and I wanted to get your input on this. You know, it's more of a phased in approach uh, and it, it, it backs away from any one size fits all potential model that we're overlaying atop the entire a system, uh, again, a new way to think about it. Uh, and I wanted to get your input there. So the next slide is questions and, and comments. Uh, what I'd like to do now is just kind of uh, stop and um, I'm going to I'm going to stop the screen share. So we, we uh, come back and if anybody has any questions or comments or feedback for me, I'm happy to uh, happy to take that at that's at, uh, you know, at this time, and I can I can always pull this back up and go back to a go a particular slide if you want to bring something back up uh, uh, for yourselves or for the public. Hi, Mark. Um, I have a few questions for you. I had an opportunity to watch the, I think it was Fox 2 News Education Town Hall that they had last week. It was really good. One of my takeaways from that was a doctor who spoke said, you can never plan for zero cases. And that resonated for me. Um, and looking at the chart, it looked like Full in person would be, I believe, like one to nine cases or zero to nine cases. And so that just resonated for me um, that there may be cases, but they may not be deadly cases. So I'm wondering in your conversation with the doctor that you spoke with, did you talk about um, the number of deaths that have decreased? And is that something to be considered in determining um, when we would go back? Um, because that chart for deaths looks very different from the number of cases. So I was just wondering if that discussion ever came out and if that's a metric that we should be looking at. Um, and then the other question would be the um, last week there was a press conference or maybe it was this week, all the days are blurring together, but um, masks reduce 70% of the risk of transmitting the virus. 
in some of the schools that had um, a resurgence and had to stop school did not have a mask mandate. And I'm wondering if um, that was the case in some of the scenarios that you looked at because wearing masks significantly reduces the risk of transmission by 70%. Yeah, so let me, uh, let me uh, address the, the first one. So in the number of deaths, a ab absolutely, we did talk about that. Uh, and we had conversations around the capacity of hospitals to appropriately treat patients that are coming in. Uh, and with a, with a reduced volume that, you know, that the whole, the whole treatment uh, with respect to what the healthcare system can do just looks a little bit, a little bit different. Uh, and, and so that's something that we did talk about. We also talked about the fact that, um, you know, there, there, there's, there's still a lot of unknowns with respect to contraction of COVID. And so um, as a strict measure, um, it's something to be considered for sure. Uh, he was more focused on that, that number of new cases for 100,000 and the positivity rate being around that 3%. Uh, that, that based on some of the information from other countries and some that have had success reopening, that those were two key indicators. They weren't the only ones. And so what I, what I also, put up there in the end, we talked about that. He even said, you know, there are local conditions for your community that you need to, you need to, you need to think about. Um, he, he taught, he used the phrase, um, what's the performance of the business? Meaning there may be needs as you get into a virtual environment that uh, appear as such where you might think differently because the performance of your business um, is, is compromised in some way. And so that causes you to make a, make a decision within those ranges um, you know, based on those local conditions. And so he also talked about engaging the community uh, and, uh, and really taking a look at this holistically. And then the final thing that I do want to uh, share about other, other information, uh, you know, just other, other information in general. I, I did, we did have a conversation with him about, um, about these triggers and thresholds. And I, and I, I just told him, I said, look, um, I, I'm uncomfortable embracing a, a trigger at this point because you have, you know, you have differences of opinion within the medical community right now. Um, I, you know, I've talked to some, some physicians who have said, um, you know, el elementary is, is probably fine right now. Maybe you delay secondary. I talked to other physicians who say a virtual environment right now is completely appropriate. You shouldn't think about any, doing anything else until the number of new cases go down and the positivity rate goes down. So there are a variety of opinions there. And so what, what he, he did confirm, he said, you know, I would, I would, he said he would caution anyone from stating right now, here, here are the things we're gonna declare right now in order to make decisions two months from now, because we might have a new report or a new source of information that comes available. Um, Kind of like what, what was impacting our thinking with the new cases for zero to 19 year olds. I mean, that was, that was a big part of our thinking and some of the, um, some of the fear in the community over the last couple of weeks with that spike. So uh, he cautioned against that. Um, he didn't say you shouldn't or couldn't, you know, I, I don't want to make it sound like he said, no, don't do that. You're, you're in danger. It wasn't that at all. He just said that I, he, he said, thinking about this in a broader terms, thinking about all of the factors and for your decision-making uh, is, is, is probably a, you know, is probably a smart way to go because then you, 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 you allow for the ability for additional information, new reports, new research to inform your thinking over time. So, um, so that was related to your first question. And then the second question about, about masks. Um, yes, and so when we, when we started this from the, from, the, from the outset, there were three key factors that came to us as reported from, the, from those that worked on the MI, the Michigan Return to School Roadmap, three key factors for, for risk mitigation. Um, this wasn't suppression or elimination, but risk mitigation. How do you lower risk? Um, they were wearing masks. To, to your point about the significant reduction in spread with masks, uh, proper hygiene, that would be hand washing, hand sanitation, that type of thing. Uh, and then social distancing and cohorting, trying to keep, basically keep people away from one another um, in schools to the degree possible, to the reason, to a reasonable degree, that those were the three factors. So masks was, uh, wearing a mask was, was definitely up there. Um, and in fact, I think there was one picture that went viral from a school district where there were kids in the hallway, they're kind of packed in one place and 
you know, everybody, there were a lot of kids that weren't wearing their masks. I don't think, I don't think very, very few kids were that, that I saw. So that's something that, that still is very, very important to us. And in fact, we, we talked to our focus groups initially. We were thinking, oh, sorry, my light turned off. Hang in one second. Okay, it'll pop back on. Um, our, uh, our thinking initially was that, uh, and we were receiving some recommendations from our focus groups that, you know, they were concerned about how the wearing of masks for kindergarten and fifth graders would impact their, their being in school uh, and, uh, and would really cause an issue. And so we, that was part of our initial plan. We brought it up with the instruction committee uh, and had some further discussion about that. We saw the increase in cases that were going on in zero to 19 year olds and ultimately our plan um, included a, um, a mat, you know, wearing a mask K, K through 12. So I think that's something that we're, we're still committed to unless the research were to, were to change. So I definitely think it was a factor in, in some of those other situations uh, for sure. So, um, so I, I hope that that helps. I know that's something that it, uh, we're, we're committed to and the feedback plan with the mask again, initially when we were posing that to, to some, uh, some parents, they were concerned about it, but over time, I think people were we're comfortable with that requirement. Yeah, and the only reason I'm asking, I'm not trying to make a case um, either way, is just that when looking at that chart, I don't know, I mean, it could be years from now before we get to less than nine um, cases per day. Does that mean we would never go full in person? So I'm just hoping that we can have a discussion to determine where we land and which metrics we want to use to help us make a decision whether we go back um, full in person when we do. Um, so I'm just hoping that we can de determine what metrics we want to use for that. And this yes, is trusty, a tr um, yeah, I'm sorry, Trustee Edgel, let me go. I, you know what, I, I'm so sorry. I was just gonna tag on to Trustee McKinney's. It was kind of like a segue into um, maybe creating some kind of a timeline, you know, even if it's tentative, Well, what I do know is every every time we get together, um, you know, we we've got to talk COVID data, um, and and again, that was in the resolution that you passed, with respect to what we were we were going to do. We were going to talk about this on a on an ongoing basis, and so that'll be part of what we what we do over time. Um, I, I think Trustee McKinney raises the the million dollar question, right? What what are what are the metrics? How do we interpret them? I think I think we have a good idea of what those metrics are. These are the numbers that we've been looking at for some time. It's, it's really us determining what our comfort level is with respect to where those are at. Um, and and so I, you know, again, back to what Dr. Kathari said. Do we, you know, do we arbitrarily pick something now that that you know we're going to be beholden to later on? Or do we have this ongoing discussion over time uh, and establish a timeline um, where you know every every month we're we're going back and saying, okay, here's the data, here, here's here, here, here's what my recommendation is based on what we're hearing from the health advisory group, or we're hearing from our focus groups. Uh, and it seems to make sense uh, based on the data and where we're at in, in yellow and orange. So, and the final thing I do want to say is I don't think that the green category of the less than one, that's the only way in which, I, I don't interpret it as that's the only way in which you can go back all in person. That just means like, hey, that's the green light according to that Harvard site that says all schools can open at that point in time. You know, it, it's essentially, there's still vigilance that needs to be applied, but we can all open up. I do think there's room within that one to nine, certainly to consider having everybody come back for a full uh, in-person learning experience. So one last quick question. I'm sorry, Amy. So if we, when we determine it's okay to go back to school in person, what is the turnaround time for us to be able to execute on that? So it depends on the model that we're gonna implement. So if so, if we were to if we were to go back to our uh, Birmingham Virtual Academy and hybrid environment uh, th that we were originally thinking we were you know we were thinking we were going to move ahead with, we we only conceivably could do that uh, at the uh, at the trimester at the high school and the elementary, or at the semester at the middle school, and the reason for that is that would coincide with our. Our, you know, our traditional grading period. And at that point in time, what we have to do is consider teacher changes because we would still be giving parents an option in the virtual academy. 
And so we would need to assign teachers to continue to teach in an all virtual environment for those that would wanted that environment, even if we did go back in person. And then we would need to have teachers available to teach in the hybrid environment. And so in order to not, you know, cause an uprooting of, of our entire infrastructure before grades are even issued and, and, and possibly force a lot of people into changing teachers, we, we really could realistically only do that at those markers, at the trimester or at the semester. If, however, we were to think about this slow, kind of like a slow roll or a slow phase in, it doesn't mean that we have to abandon our thoughts about the virtual academy or the hybrid. That, that may be of value to us at some point in time. You know, maybe our numbers stagnate for a period of time. The metrics across the country don't look good for whatever reason. And we think, well, realistically, we could potentially be in that in this phase four hybrid environment for a long period of time. That, that may be appropriate. But um, if we were to think a little differently about this and say, OK, um, let's let's kind of use this Harvard guidance and think a little differently. Well, maybe we could entertain, again, this slow introduction. Let's start with one-on-one. -on -one. For our students who need some one-on-one -on -one instruction right now, how do we do that safely? What additional protocols do we need to have in place? Let's put those in place uh, and then see what kind of success we have. And then, then take a look at small groups across the district from a system standpoint. How might we address their needs? Then according to the, um, uh, this Harvard guidance, how might we think about um, perhaps special education students, uh, our youngest elementary learners, and, and just think really carefully and methodically about a slow re-entry to in-person um, that satisfies the, you know, the, the needs of, of all of our students, all of our staff, and all of our families. Um, if we were to think about something like that, I, I think then, again, it's, we're, we're, we're applying a, it, it, it's basically, a, it's a differential, right? We're taking a look at our highest need students and, and, and trying to figure out how instruction can work for, for those students um, while we're maintaining that virtual environment. And we could conceivably do that um, relatively quickly. Uh, we just need to make sure we've got the protocols in place that are appropriate for everyone, that make everyone feel comfortable, given the rates where they're at right now and the concern that people have, uh, and then put that in place and measure the success of those. So I think those we could do relatively quickly. So um, I hope that helps explain maybe the difference between the two and how those would be applied based on the different, you know, the different strategies for bringing students back in. Uh, Mark, so... I have a couple things. First of all, your question regarding the advisory panel, I'm all for it. In fact, I'd say sign those people up in the next 48 hours, get them working, get, um, I, I mean, I love numbers and I love charts and graphs, but that was a dizzying array of information. I really think at some point, part of what this panel is going to need to do is identify the most specific and most important metric we are going to be focusing on and then use the other metrics as supporting data especially when you're in that like gray area of a certain standard deviation that you feel comfortable saying we need to look at something else in order to make this call um so so that's all I need to say on that. Um, but then I also think that something that we desperately need as a result of um, what we've heard from public comment, emails we've received, um, personal interactions that various trustees have had is um, much more specific and um, I, I think tighter scenarios for how to deal with um, cases within a school, cases within um, classrooms, cases within cohorts, because um, I, I've seen information from um, the Oakland County Health Department that I don't think gave people a lot of comfort around the specificity of what to do. Um, it doesn't address uh, false positives or false negative cases. It doesn't address necessarily um, families who test positive and quarantining measures that we need to put in place. Um, I, I think uh, 
Trustee Young outlined many of those things. But you know, if we're if we're identifying medical professionals, I mean, I, I'm assuming they're far more well equipped than I would be to put some of that in place. So I would really like to suggest that that be something that become part of that public health advisory council. And, um, you know, I would welcome it to be more stringent than what Oakland County Health Department has recommended, especially if um, it, 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 if it gives us some comfort to be able to get kids back in buildings. And that's it. Uh, thank you, it's on the list. <laughs> Thanks. I have a couple of questions. Um, I don't know if anyone else does. Um, Mark, you said that some things that were, some factors that were important um, in your research, among them were um, masks, cohort size, and hygiene. Um, is that is that a fair representation of what you said? Yeah, co cohorts combined with social distancing. Okay, I have a couple of questions about those factors. Um, First, given their importance to you and to the, to the um, community doing research around this, in addition to the, to the numerical updates that Amy just talked about, which we just got a, a wealth of, can we get updates on those factors? For example, um, hygiene. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if we have um, hand sanitizer with 60% with alcohol in it available for all classrooms and common areas and, and whatever. Um, I don't know if we are giving intermittent breaks to high school classrooms and middle school classrooms that don't have bathrooms attached to do hand washing. Um, so I give those two as examples just to say that like I would appreciate getting an update on that, on the hygiene factor, because that is so essential to a safe return to school. Similarly, I would appreciate an update on cohorts. So one of the things we talked about in previous meetings was, while um, are you accounting for, for sports? Um, which is sort of a different issue now that MHSSA has made the decision they have, but not really because practices are still happening. But but the answer was no, we're not. We're accounting for for class choice and then um, and and then sizes and some other things. So if cohort size is important, which I agree it is, the research says it is. Can you give us an update on that too, to the extent possible? I know that, you know, as Trustee McKinney pointed out um, in asking how long is this switch gonna take? Like once, once we hit these levels number wise, do we need four weeks to pivot? Do we need, like how much time are we talking here? Because part of that is going to be all the planning that goes into cohorting and things like that. But just to get an update as to how you're thinking about organizing it, um, would be helpful too. And then with respect to masks, um, how are you going to, you you being the district, how are we going to um, enforce that with students of all ages? What's that going to look like? Um, one thing I said at the last meeting was one of the, um, and I sent you my comments, so you, so you have those, but one of the groups that I looked at recommended positive only enforcement because it's a public health issue and you want to encourage people to do the right thing um, and build a sense of community and things like that. Um, but would we send a kid home if, if he or she did not wear a mask um, or they did not wear a mask? Um, you know, so I'm interested in just having updates on those three factors, cohort, um, mask enforcement and hygiene since since you did mention that those were um, important to you. And then finally, um, to, to Trustee Hokemer's point, that was a great deal of information, um, but I do think that some in the community will say, well, how did you choose those? Um, why did you choose those? 
And, and I think you know that we've gotten emails from people that cite sources that aren't in this in this PowerPoint. And so um, if you could if you could give us a little bit of information as to how you decided, and I agree with Trustee Hookmer, it was a great deal of information. So it's not lacking in quantity, but how did you land upon those sources and why? Um, I think I think would be helpful to the community, especially to those who have sent sources that they didn't see in this presentation. Uh, I can definitely update on those the three items that you mentioned, um, and and you know we have plans for we have plans for all those, but I, I'll I'll definitely make sure we can get information and make it publicly available. With Thank respect you. to the sources, um, I uh, really th these were the mo these are the most commonly talked about statistics that people are citing with respect to the return of school, um, and so um, uh, those are. Um, I, again, those are the most common, and you can see the wide variation with some of the state comparisons and the decisions that other, other countries have made. Uh, that, that number per 100,000 uh, in the positivity test, testing rate, those are the two that are uh, most commonly reported and that you'll see in the media most, most frequently. And so uh, if you look at the Oakland County Health Site too, those are the statistics that are most commonly available. There are some things that you don't see here, uh, and one, this is one of the reasons why I'm you know, I, 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 I want to establish this panel. So uh, we, we have heard from some, some of our stakeholders about um, uh, uh, ICU, and you saw on one of the slides, ICU capacity, um, hosp hospital bed availability, uh, local conditions in local hospitals and how that impacts what's happening. Um, some of that information is not readily available. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and the, those that are suggesting it will, will say that. So I'd like to get some insiders that have a, a better, just a better understanding of, of what, that, what that could potentially look like for us and how it can inform our decision-making, you know, moving forward. Um, so uh, I, that would be my general, general response. When we've, when we've talked to the, when we have talked to the county and talked about, uh, you know, when we've asked for guidance uh, and they've tried to share with us what the impact COVID's having on our communities, those, those are the most often cited statistics. So, and, and I will share with you, um, I'm open to looking at, at you know, any, anything. And in fact, subsequent to our last meeting, um, I was corresponding with one, um, uh, one doctor in particular who's watching the meeting and we uh, had an exchange in email and, and I asked him flat, like, are there any other metrics we should be looking at? Here are the main ones that we're looking at right now. Uh, and, and he agreed to provide some help. So I, I know that there are people out there that would be willing to help us and we can definitely expand that. Um, Mark. It, oh. oh, I was just gonna say, it's not the data points per se that, that I was mentioning, but rather the sources themselves. So people, may take umbrance with your reliance on the New York Times um, or Harvard. And I'm, and I'm just wondering why, um, why them, why, why Oregon, why, why, so like, um, or Oregon as people always correct me instead of Oregon, but why, um, why those? Well, so, oh, can I just add Adrian, on? To Adrian, that? Adrian, uh, great question. Why Oregon? Why Connecticut? Why, why, why? Okay, can I can I just answer only from the perspective of Mark and I have shared some of this data, and it was more as a model for the way in which a state could provide metrics for schools to look at not so much the thresholds that they are using or targeting, but more the model itself, because um, I think we all agreed that phase four, our return to learn plan did not provide specific thresholds or metrics for us to look at. And, and many would say we're still struggling as a state to actually do that for us. So it's not that we think that whatever Oregon is doing is what we should do. It's more an example of something that is um, across the board 
for districts to look at as opposed to every district coming up with their own metrics. Does that make sense? So it's almost like don't, rec don't recreate the wheel. Let's look at some examples that are out there of what we perhaps may model ours after. Yeah. And I mean, just um, to follow up on Adrian's comment, um, I, I mean, the New York Times might be using certain metrics, but for example, they're building on metrics that the World Health Organization, the CDC, and other you know larger health organizations have also cited. I, like I think World Health Organization uses that three percent positivity threshold. So um, I, I agree with you that we probably need to be as open as possible about why we're using them. But in many cases, there are multiple sources that are citing the same um, metrics. And yeah, I, sorry, and Mark, now you can take over. <laughs> yeah, well, I just want to say, I, I tried as much as I... Um, okay. I, um, I'm, I'm sorry, President Wynn, I, I just, just one quick thing. You know, I, again, the, I, I, think, I think it's important to point out that the county information on, on cases per 100,000 compared to what the New York Times is reporting on cases per 100,000 and the COVID Act now, admittedly, I did say that those are coming from, uh, coming from the Times, at least relative to our county, our state, and what the Times is reporting based on their access to health department records, those, they're, they're pretty, you know, they're pretty similar. That statistic for the number of new cases per 100,000 um, is the same at the county, the state, and, uh, and with the Times. Uh, and, and so I, I, but I will say if there are other sources that can confirm this and we can rely on some experts in the field to put an exclamation point behind any of it, um, you know, that, that would be the point behind creating this medical, you know, a medical advisory team that could, that could help us with that. Hey, Mark. I just wanted to say that um, I think a, an advisory board um, would be a, a, just a great thing. Can you hear me? Yep. Can you, yep. Can you hear me? You know, I think I think like a physician advisory board. There's so many great people in in Birmingham and 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 physicians also that could you know they could you know they just have they have great opinions. They they're not gonna they're not gonna say anything that's like you know. I'm, they're going to lead you down a path that's not the right path. I think the advisory board, um, the health advisory board, would be a very good thing to think about because you have a you have you have a, a you have a lot of people, and you have um, you, you just have great people that are willing to help just because they want because they love Birmingham. Yeah, thanks, and that and that's what I'm seeing too in the emails that are coming into me. Um, Positive, neutral, or critical. You know, people have said, "Hey, call, call on me." Uh, and I, I've reached out to doctors as well, both on our focus groups, and I, you know, I've had some individual conversations with doctors who who have shared their opinions. Um, and and I think I think really the the key thing here is is identifying number one to to Trustee Young's point. You know, are, are there other metrics? And Trustee McKinney's point too, with respect to you know death rates and how that may be figured. And that's not that that wasn't a chief part of this presentation. Are there other metrics, or do people have access to metrics that maybe we're not thinking about? One and two, how how might the interpretation of all this help guide our thinking? Um, I, I, I will tell you that um, uh, to be very candid, I, we we were we were thinking that at this point in time. The health department would have a larger role in providing some guidance, and I, I don't mean to throw people under the bus. I'm sure these are hardworking individuals; they're working really hard. Um, and again, from an individual standpoint, when we've had cases, you know, our our staff has worked really well with them, and they've provided us good good guidance with how these individual cases can be handled. But looking more broadly at the entirety of the picture, um, I think I think we're left in phase four with. This, in, this entire from you're all virtual to you're all back um, with some some safety protocols in place. There's such a wide variation there, um, uh, you know, without any any without any direction, without a compass. And so, this is really just acknowledging that and saying, okay, um, you know, this report that we saw today in MLive that Trustee Holcomer shared said we're, we may not get anything for another two weeks. So let's look internally and. And, and engage our, you know, engage our parents who have some expertise here, here to, to help us with those two things. 
So thanks. So Mark, I don't know if this question then pivots to the next part of the presentation. So um, to kind of pull us up 30, 40,000 feet in the air, um, you've identified that you are going to pull together a medical advisory team and that it seems like our next logical steps are to come up with some threshold or metrics um, to which we will then start to apply on a weekly, monthly, et cetera basis. From the, for, for the community, can you give us a timeline um, what can we start to expect some data? When can we expect um, just some thoughts for input? Um, obviously, school starts August 31st. Um, so just again, for the community perspective and for us trustees. Hey, and Kim, great question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Kim, you. great question. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Brian. So I heard, I heard 48 hours uh, and so, um, uh, I, 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 I know I know that you, you were saying ASAP. So, and that's really the goal. I, want, I wanted to share this presentation today, make sure that you had the opportunity to provide guidance. Um, this, this is coming across as more of a study session item, but, but I still wanted some guidance. So now that you've given the nod, I mean, I do want to proceed as quickly as possible. Uh, we were planning on after this meeting, providing an update uh, for the community with respect to this and our virtual learning plan. Uh, and the thought is that we would have, uh, you know, we would have some information there where parents could submit their information, what they do professionally related to the field, uh, and then we could select some, you know, select some people to start to work uh, as soon as possible. So um, I know right now it's August 18th. I think our next study session is September 1st. Um, my my goal is to to really every time we meet to share with you an update. So. Um, I can't remember if our if the resolution we passed had the word ongoing, or if it said continuous. Um, but I think those imply the same thing. I I, were, I really I want to bring this up to everybody all the time, uh, and and make sure that you've got you know the best information as a board, uh, and then our community knows you know publicly what it is that we're thinking about. So I'm I'm. I'm pretty confident that by September 1st, even though school school have just been started for four days at that point, you know, we'll have an update for the community at that study session. And then we have another study session in September and a meeting um, uh, in September. So um, there may be some things that we could potentially, uh, you know, action or think more deeply about after the committee's had a chance to meet a couple of times and provide some information back to the board for feedback. Mark, can I also just offer that maybe we should study some of the best practices that are happening um, in our surrounding areas? I know two of my friends um, head up youth programs, one in Detroit uh, who ran a, a successful summer program. Um, my son played baseball this summer um, and his coach had a very strict mask mandate. Um, so the picture of his his team playing baseball was very different from another picture that I saw recently. Those boys did not mess around. They wore their masks at um, practice and during games. And another friend of mine heads up a youth program in Chicago and they are returning students as well. And both of those communities were hot spots at some point. Um, we know DPSCD ran a successful summer program and they're preparing to um, welcome students this fall. So I would just say, let's look at some best practices that are happening around us to see what we can learn from those. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Thanks. I, and, I, and I think um, you've uplift, uplifted an important point. You know, we've been focusing on, you know, some of the challenging um, aspects of experiences that schools have had. You know, it's, it's important to look on the flip side of that. So yeah, thanks. Anything else, trustees? Okay, Mark, we'll turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you. And uh, thanks for that feedback. I, I do appreciate it. Okay, just double checking. I, it looks like everybody can see okay. So I wanted to just uh, give everyone a quick uh, quick update on our re uh, return to school. So as, after we um, uh, uh, really uh, last last week, uh, after, the, after the board met, our team started meeting, uh, started meeting with administrators. Well, we had been meeting with administrators already. Uh, we continue those meetings. Uh, I started meeting with the teachers and the DEA about all aspects of our return to school. Uh, 
We've had some uh, continued discussions with, with Schoology, our, our new um, virtual learning platform. And so uh, uh, this will hopefully give you a quick update. So I, I wanted to tell everybody, first of all, all of our 46 and 52 week employees are reporting daily with flexibility as needed based on their, based on their standards. So some people in the community have asked, you know, who's back, what's going on. Um, we, we do have all of those employees back. And when I say with flexibility as needed, just like all office places around the country right now and across the state, there are varying degrees of flexibility that employers are providing. Uh, for 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 employees, whether it's due to a you know, health situation or some flexibility that they need, uh, and so we we talked to we talked to our uh, you know our, our our team of educators uh, and our support staff about you know wanting to make sure we started the school year successfully and making sure that we had people people available people to answer the phone that type of thing. So we are back with some flexibility. Um, we are. Um, uh, uh, we're working with, with with teachers and it's our expectation that teachers are going to be conducting the live virtual instruction in classrooms three times per week uh, with flexibility that's provided there uh, there as well uh, and so we wanted to make sure that there were a couple of things that were in place number one well first of all we we, we of course we're going to open our buildings to our staff to be able to utilize whether it was broadband issues internet access resources that were available at the school we wanted to make sure that that was available to them um, learning resources. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we had resources available for our teachers when they're working with students. Um, and, and also in the event that we uh, needed to consider, you know, toggling back to, to any type of in-person environment, wh whether it was as significant a shift as the virtual academy and the hybrid that we've talked about in the past, or something like a slow phase in that I mentioned earlier, um, you know that, of course, is going to be better if we have people that are are are, are available. Uh, and then we need to we need to provide some flexibility as needed. One of the things that I do, I do want to um, remind all of our, all of our trustees about is in the in the event that there's a, a COVID related situation that our employees are facing, uh, and in particular. This could be in conjunction with the closure of a uh, of a school. And if schools are going virtual right now under the eyes of the law, that is considered. If they're going virtual, that's considered a, a school closure relative to the uh, first uh, corona, uh, coronavirus um, uh, families first act. Uh, employees can request a leave uh, for uh, for uh, up to twelve weeks related to that. And so we needed to make sure there was flexibility in there. So if if uh, if our if our teachers or or uh, administrators or staff members were, were you know juggling other things that they needed to juggle related to the coronavirus in order to make sure that we had staff available we needed to make sure that there was flexibility so um, that's in there uh, 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 so we're, 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 we're settled there at this point our professional learning uh, launch is going to begin next week it's going to focus on Schoology uh, and um, we're also going to include some social emotional learning and online uh, environment uh, how, how that's actually done in an online environment so we've got a module on that and then we're, we're nearly complete with all of our schedules for high school, middle school, elementary school, our post-secondary environment, uh, and, and BCS. Uh, and at this point in time, our next few slides have the latest uh, iterations of our, of our schedules. Um, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Roberson to talk about our, our schedules and the latest, the latest versions of those. Uh, good evening. So um, the first slide has, if you can change the slide for me, um, the elementary schedule. Uh, the elementary schedule still says draft. It has not been changed from what was sent out to the community. The reason that it still says draft is because the actual schedules will come from the building level. This will allow the principals to create schedules that have the unified arts teachers in there at the, um, at the specified time. Unified Arts teachers will teach some live sessions, some, um, some sessions will be asynchronous. And so since um, they are teaching some of those classes live, and they couldn't all occur at the same time. So that is why that um, you will see a, a local schedules from the building level. The other thing I do wanna to bring to your attention about the elementary schedule is the blocks of time um, you see language arts is a, a block of 90 minutes. Mathematics is a, a block of 90 minutes. And I, I wanna bring your attention to this because we also know that um, you think about kindergarten students or first grade students, they're not going to sit 
through a, a 90 minute lecture and that is not the purpose of that 90 minute block. The purpose um, of that those time periods is so that the teacher can um, emulate what, sh what he or she does in the classroom, doing a mini lesson, um, having um, the students model um, in, uh, the assignment that they're doing, turning their videos off for a, a bit, working on the activity independent, and then coming back. Also, it gives the opportunity for teachers to work with students in small group sessions instead of having students on there for um, the entire time, 90 minutes in a large group block. So I just want to bring that to your attention just because I know that some parents you know, saw the time and said, oh my gosh, I can't believe that you know, we would have a six-year-old, for instance, sitting for that, that amount of time, but that is not the purpose. The purpose is for the teacher to be available, but to work between large group and small group sessions. The other thing to note in this schedule, schedule is that we did put in um, one-on-one. -on -one. So we have small group instruction time in language arts and in math, but we also put additional one-on-one -on -one or small group instruction time for interventions. Um, that again, could be used for our reading specialists, our LRC, but it also could be used for our classroom teachers to say, you know what? I just wanna work with two or three students on um, a particular word sort, and they have time within their schedule to do that. Um, we will be working as an instructional committee uh, to determine the most effective way to use those intervention um, blocks, um, both at the elementary and the middle school level. Dr. Roberson, can I interrupt real quick if we go back to the slide? Are these timeframes, the one-on-one -on -one and small group instructions, and maybe in other areas during this in the schedule, are they are there opportunities where um, we're going to see teachers maybe team teach or utilize paraprofessionals? I'm just wondering how we can bring in our parapros and then maybe even combine, you know, teachers to kind of um, help each other. Absolutely. Um, this would be, be a big time. And, and that's another reason why all of the schedules can't be the exact same so that we can utilize different staff, whether that be paraprofessionals or um, a teacher working together with another teacher to, um, you know, be one teacher or the paraprofessional could be with the large group while the teacher is pulling a small group of three or four students and working with them in a breakout room. So um, we absolutely plan on utilizing utilizing um, as much as possible those collaboration periods of time with our staff. And, and here's the middle school schedule. Um, with the middle school schedule, there is time for, um, again, both a synchronous and asynchronous teaching. There's an A squared or C3 at the beginning of each day. And that is a uh, built-in time for social emotional um, learning. You know, one of the things that we heard loud and clear is, you know, uh, the uh, need for social emotional support, especially in this virtual environment. And so this is built right in into the schedule for um, teachers to work with students. And then it, as you can see, we had, um, the synchronous time be three additional periods in addition to the A squared, C3 squared um, here. And some people looked at the elementary schedule and said, oh my goodness, it looks like elementary may be doing more live synchronous learning than middle school. But that's not so because the elementary schedule, again, are large blocks with some large group and small, some small group. This middle school schedule, these kids will be on during these um, synchronous times. During the asynchronous times, it's not necessarily devoid of uh, interaction. Um, that asynchronous time could be used submitting videos, um, responses for feedback, watching pre-recorded videos or webinars, participating in online and discussion forums, working with small or, or working with a small group on a collaboration project. We also included one-on-one -on -one or small group intervention time here in the middle school schedule. Again, just trying to be cognizant that some students may need that time during um, kind of built into the school day to make sure that we're capturing as many students as we can. For the high school schedule, um, their synchronous- Yes. 
Could I just ask one quick question? Because I know um, there's been a little bit of confusion. So if I look at this Monday schedule, um, you have lunch 11, 25 to 1205, and then there's an asynchronous period right after that. If as a family, you have something that you need to do, mom wants to run an errand, whatever, needs to take the child with her. Is this something that has to be done at that time? Or is this something that is a flexible, a true flexible learning period? I'm it so glad you asked that, um, Amy. I'm so glad because that's exactly what I was gonna jump in and. Yeah, cause I, I've just seen that posted uh, on various sites and I didn't know the answer myself, so. Yes, anywhere where you see the green area, which is the asynchronous time, it is a truly flexible thing. So they would look into Schoology, there would be an assignment posted. Um, they don't have to do it at 12.05. We put the schedule together so that, um, you know, as much as possible, it can feel like school in that. Um, if they want to stick to a schedule, they can. Um, but if the student wanted to do that activity um, at three o'clock in the afternoon, they could. Now, that is with the caveat that, you know, when they go to school the next day, that teacher may be expecting that they have done that assignment on Monday. So right. um, any time on Monday, though, would suffice. Okay, thanks. And then with the high school schedule, we have increased um, the synchronous time to four periods, one period of asynchronous um, instruction to allow the students, um, you know, at least one time of the day where they can do something independently. Um, but it also reflects um, the rigor necessary for high school students to be able to be prepared um, for, you know, their, uh, their classes and for, you know, college prep as well. Um, now, they have X block um, built into the schedule on Tuesday and Thursday. Um, and one of the things that will be occurring is um, the uh, faculty advisory committees at both high schools will have some conversation about how to best utilize X block so that it can be the most effective. The next, um, the next two schedules are also the uh, post-secondary schedules. Um, originally, now this is a change because originally when we posted um, the post-secondary schedules, they looked um, similar to the high school schedule. Um, but um, Renee Ruiz and Laura Mahler have worked the post-secondary schedule so that this gives more information to um, our parents about what their students will be doing particularly because there are some nuances to post-secondary that are different than um, our students that are in high, um, high school in the ninth through 12th grade program. So this is an example of the cognitively um, impaired class, um, classrooms uh, draft schedule. And again, this is a draft schedule because there are some differences within teachers um, that, that um, again, that may make these uh, times and periods um, different. Um, and we also, but you see that it has scheduled work and um, small group instruction and centers. Uh, again, really the detail of what uh, the a cognitively impaired classroom would need for the post-secondary level. And then we also have the post-secondary schedule for um, ASD, our ASD students. Um, and you see it has the ULS activities already built in, um, work-based learning as well. Um, and then, of course, the choice board activity would be something that would do be done during the asynchronous time. The next three schedules, um, they are very similar to the elementary schedules and the middle school schedules we saw before, but they are the BCS schedules. So there are a couple of nuances that are just different in terms of they have uh, co-curricular classes that are added into, um, into the three, four, um, five, six, and, um, and the seventh, eighth schedule. I'm not gonna go into detail because again, they're very similar. It's just um, the nuances that are um, Jermaine to BCS. And Bika, yes. Sorry, I have one other quick question. Um, when, you know, if blue is asynchronous and green is synchronous or vice versa, what's that orange? 
So orange on the, um, these are the co-curricular and there was also kind of like an orange peaches on the elementary yeah. way. Those, they, depending on the schedule, sometimes they will be live and sometimes they will be asynchronous. So oh, okay. it just depends on the local schedule that comes out it, it, that those will switch. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, okay. So the return to school update. There's um, at the building level. So just just to give you an update of all the different departments and what they're working on. Building level. Um, the principals are working on scheduling resource and technology deployments coordinated at the building levels to make sure that the students are able to have access to those consumable books and things that they can use at home. Um, Again, there is going to be specific schedule cre creation at the elementary level. That's why some of those um, schedules said draft is because those are at the local level. Um, I, I'm just reading for uh, Laura Mahler, but this is her work that IEP and 504 plan compliance. Um, they're looking at IEP and 504 plan compliance and we'll be looking at whether or not students needed need recovery service. So, um, they will be doing some audits around that and will be providing recovery services when needed. And then they're also going to be doing evaluations on the IEPs and, um, and also looking at students 504s, making sure that their current plans um, you know, may need to be rewritten in this new environment so that they're meeting the needs of the students in the virtual environment. Dr. Roberson, can I, can I um... Just stop you there for a second and invite uh, Laura to just come in and say a few Absolutely. things about there. Yeah, there. Yeah, there were just there are a couple of things. So um, I know Trustee Jennings attended a meeting with uh, our uh, our PAC parents uh, this morning. We had a, a meeting today at nine thirty, and um, I, I, I was uh, just hoping, Laura, if you could maybe touch on a couple of things that that were discussed there that you know aren't necessarily bulleted here, but um, you know are the are, are trust would want to know about with respect to therapies and other items that we share with them. Of course, thank you and good evening to everyone. Um, we, um, as you may recall, we contract for our OT occupational and physical therapy services and we have met with um, uh, the point person that we work with from the company and we have asked them to look at um, setting things up with those um, therapists so that they can be um, offering to families either in-person or um, virtual one-on-one um, -on -one, um, therapies for those two um, um, therapies for those students that have that written into their IEP. Um, those would happen at the home school um, where the students would normally be attending. Um, but of course, we have many families that are not comfortable sending their children in. And so we need to continue to offer virtual as well. Um, we had a, a, a nice um, success this summer during our um, extended school year um, program that we offered in July, where our therapists and our teachers were doing one-on-one um, -on -one, uh, virtual services. And we got good feedback from them and parents saying that it was, um, there certainly were many more students that that virtual one-on-one -on -one therapy was valuable for um, than, than in a group setting um, in the springtime. So um, while we recognize that it won't be 100% of kids, um, we're, we're hopeful that that one-on-one -on -one therapy, even virtually will be better uh, better for the, to meet their needs um, this, this school year. And, um, and then we'll start as, as quickly as we can with um, coordinating with families with a schedule for the OT and PT services as uh, directed by those IEPs. Another uh, piece that we're working on is that um, we, we, are, we have been directed uh, by everyone, federal, state, county level, um, that we want to keep our students' um, individual education plans or IEP plans intact. We want to leave those written for a typical, normal five-day-a-week, full-day program. That, that is, um, every IEP tells the story of that child, and it tells what their strengths are and what their needs are 
and what the team, including the family, have agreed upon as, as what that child needs at that moment. And so we, we are, um, we're, we're going to continue to hold IEPs as those are an annual um, event for each child. And so as they come due, we'll continue to hold them um, and, and make any changes that the members of that team and including the parents deem necessary. But we also are obligated to write individual contingency learning plans. So um, like everywhere else in education, we have all sorts of little code words. And so we call them CLPs. So we have IEPs and CLPs now. Um, and a contingency plan is going to be written uh, with the IEP team and the family for each child. And that plan will be um, essentially a written document that outlines what the current reality is. That's where if things are slightly different from what a tip, the typical IEP um, is written for, given that the fact we're virtual, that's where we're gonna document and keep track of and make sure everyone's on the same page, um, both staff and families. So parents will, um, we are waiting on getting um, uh, the details and the template for those plans, we, I have an 8 a.m. Thursday morning meeting where they've promised to be giving those to us. Um, they've asked uh, all uh, districts within the county to use the same guidelines and same template. So we're waiting on those and we'll get those Thursday morning and then we'll turn that around and get it out to our staff and our families in a communication to each of them to uh, explain how those will happen. So um, um, we'll need to be having a conversation about each child and writing that contingency plan. Um, obviously we can't do, you know, 11, we have about 1100 students with IEPs. We can't do all those in the first week of school. Um, so um, not enough hours in the day. The, so we will get after getting those done as quickly as possible. That doesn't mean that a student's IEP does not remain in effect. It does, it doesn't go away. This isn't, um, this isn't a time to try to reduce services or anything like that. That's not what this is about. Um, it's simply about documenting the reality of it. we're in a virtual situation. We're not in school five days a week, one-on-one. -on -one, so what's different? You know, what, what's different for each child? Um, so we'll be writing those contingency learning plans as quickly as we can. And, and of course, beginning the first day of school, um, just like general education, our staff will begin with providing services to children um, based on their IEPs and based on their needs. Um, Mark, did I cover everything from this morning or am I? I think yes, I did. thanks. Yep. Okay. Yes, thanks. Thank Appreciate it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Moving on, I'll, I'll just roll through this quickly. Uh, Dr. Roberson, if there's something you want to add, uh, you know, please and could jump in. So our teaching and learning department, we, we are uh, facilitating professional development for administrators. It really, um, and this is principals, assistant principals, and the, and the folks are on the screen related to Schoology. And we want to be able to support teachers through a train the trainer model where our administrators have the, have the ability to uh, to provide professional learning for teachers and be leaders with respect to that. So they're gonna, they're gonna learn, that, uh, learn that system as well. Uh, and I shared earlier already our professional learning for, for teachers. Um, uh, this is something I do want Dr. Roberson to talk about. So I know she just, um, uh, just muted. So can you talk about the pacing guides and the instruction of remote committee that, that, um, that uh, the remote committee that we have running? Sure. Um, Thank you. So this, over the summer, we had teams of teachers working in the core areas to determine the essential standards and look at the pacing guide. Um, they had a test of, because we didn't know um, when we started those committees in June, what our, um, what our mode of instruction would be in the fall. Um, their task was to look at, you know, completely in person, what would pacing look like? Um, what would it look like in a remote environment? And what would it look like in a hybrid environment? Um, and they really uh, did a great job of looking at least at the first couple of months, um, looking at the entire year, but looking at giving detail for the first couple of months of what the casing would be 
for each of the curriculum areas. And that includes English language arts, math, science, social studies, and world language. So those pacing guides, in addition to, there were also pacing guides that were, um, that were created at Oakland schools, but they weren't available until August. Um, those have been used uh, together to um, give to our uh, leaders in those core areas, core areas, and they're going to be shared with teachers uh, to help guide them for their instruction in the upcoming weeks. As well, we have an instruction and remote committee, which has also been meeting since June um, in all aspects of, of this plan um, that you see with the schedules and the times and with research, that committee has done a lot of work around that. And the next steps um, we're actually meeting tomorrow um, is giving some more detail around expectations for teachers in the online environment, um, suggestions for built, how to use the built-in intervention time um, most effectively, and what will parent or and student onboarding look like so that they're also prepared to participate in this virtual environment. And so um, that committee um, includes um, not only administrators, but teachers, um, VA representatives, and, um, and, and a paraprofessional. Um, can I ask a quick question about, mostly about the parent-student onboarding for the virtual setting? Yes. Um, so I, I can't really remember when, but at some point, I think we talked about, um, you know, with this virtual environment, having sort of um, templates for the teachers as to what their Schoology site would look like, sort of, I, and I don't know if we talked about it by school, by subject matter, grade, whatever, but something so that they have a base and, and basically it's not up to them to create everything from scratch. Um, and I also think that would be helpful because then as parents are leaning on each other for assistance, hopefully they're looking at something that's similar. So if, um, Kim and I both have a, a student in the same class and my child's asking for assistance and I don't understand what it is and he doesn't understand it. I can call Kim and say, hey, you know, can you look at your daughter's Schoology or whatever? So is that still something that we are looking at? Because I know that we're going to be down to the wire in terms of providing um, any kind of you know, training for the parents and the students. And so obviously we wanna make it as easy as possible. Absolutely, I mean, that's that's part of what the committee is looking at when we are talking about the expectations so that we have some consistency of what okay. that will look like. Um, we, our teacher committee is K through 12 and they'll be working tomorrow in levels to determine what that would look like. So it, what it looks like, what it looks like in the elementary may not be the same as what it looks like in the high school, but the hope is that there's some parity across the district, at least by level. Yeah, okay, perfect, thank you. So along these lines, I have a quick question, Mbika. Um, so I'm assuming that there has been learning loss since we switched to the virtual environment. And based on what you just said, a lot of this work is going to happen the first couple of months of school, I think is what I heard. But then the legislature just passed new legislation that will require students to take tests, assessments in, the, in nine weeks, I think, of school. So how does this all correlate together? How will we be preparing students for that? And then what are they looking for exactly in those assessments? Do we know? So we had planned on giving assessments for students, um, most of them local assessments within the first nine weeks, although we did plan on using the NWEA um, actually a little later in the school year, still in the fall, but a little later in school year, not necessarily in the first nine weeks. What I am hoping and what they have not released in part of that legislation is there are going to be four, they said four to five approved um, assessment um, platforms that we, you can use within a, the first nine weeks, but they haven't said what they are. I'm hoping because the NWA is something um, 
which is also called MAP, that many districts across the county, um, around across the state use. Um, including some of even our the biggest uh, school districts like Detroit Public Schools. I'm hoping that it that will be one. And if that is one, we'll just move the timeline up earlier um, to meet with the state required guidelines. Um, if it is not one, they did have a uh, another option for district um, assessment if it uh, met certain guidelines. And so, um, you know, we're going to find out what's going to give us the best information. The purpose of using the NWA is because it has been something that we've used as a district in the past and we will be able to compare data um, from previous years if we used it, if we use that particular piece. But we, um, we are working on an assessment calendar because one of the things that we know um, is that we need to know where our students are. And so that was going to be an important piece, whether it is a standardized assessment or normed assessment like NWA or whether it's um, local assessment like using the words to words their way inventory, um, the uh, reading assessment, Fontes and Pinnell, um, math unit assessments. We knew we were going to use something to make sure that we know, have a good gauge of where our students are coming in. Um, the, the other thing that we're looking at, because um, while we're working a lot in the short term, we also want to make sure that we're working in the long term as well. And that's really putting together the professional learning calendar for the entire year. Um, we have a committee working some more on that this, this actually tomorrow as well. And that is, we want to make sure that all the professional development that we're putting in place, not only for um, Schoology, but online learning in general, because it's not just about the tool, it's about um, the instructional practices, um, SEL um, and the trauma-informed learning, all of those pieces, we wanna make sure that there's some continuity to it. We don't want things to be one and done. So we wanna look at the entire scope of the year. Um, where is where is the um, professional development happening, occurring throughout the year so that teachers are getting continuous um, uh, learning around a particular subject. And again, not a one and done. We also had um, exciting new teacher orientation or it's still going on this week and that's led by um, Dean Neforos um, for Human Resources. Uh, but we had an opportunity to um, do uh, some a presentation to the new teachers around teaching and learning. And tomorrow we will be doing some work with them around diversity, e um, equity and inclusion. Um, Go practices within our district. So uh, just to continue on uh, from where uh, Dr. Robson left off. So, um, you know, we are, uh, we are thinking about um, in-person instruction and I just wanted to say a few things about that. So relative to the presentation earlier, um, you know, we will be, once the school year is launched, we're going to start conversations about individual small group and special populations in person uh, potential options. And, and again, I, I, I want to make sure that everybody understands it's not as easy as just saying, hey, we're going to do this. We need to, we need to make sure that a couple of things are in place. Number one, we can't have teachers that are operating in both the virtual environment at the same time that they are in some type of in-person environment. So we're going to have to think about tweaks in our schedule to make, make that happen. Secondly, we're going to need to look at a systems approach. Uh, and so, uh, so we make sure, for example, if there's something that we're going to be providing to one elementary school, we have it avail available for all. So we want to start some conversations with, uh, with our teachers, start thinking about PPE. Uh, and again, we'll continue to um, uh, we'll engage our, our medical uh, advisory board, uh, take a look at some factors that we can take into consideration and start, start those considerations. Those are uh, considerations. We're, we're committed to doing that. After that, we can explore. Uh, uh, go, go ahead, please. Mark, I'm sorry to interrupt, um, but you, you mentioned something that I just had a question. Uh, I'm curious, and I don't know if this is a question for uh, Dr. Roberson or for Dwight Levins or you or all three of you, but I, I guess I don't understand why we would have to have two separate um, virtual learning programs. In other words, let's say that we have, that we, that we do our, um, our glide path into a hybrid. 
and we are still doing live streaming. And a couple of families are, you know, a certain number population do not want, do not feel comfortable going back to school and they want to continue virtual. Why can't we just live stream the face-to-face in-class hybrid class and then whoever chooses to stay home just kind of learns from that platform and not have to have a separate virtual. Do we not, so not I, do we have the yeah, I'll, 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 I'll say a few things and I, I, I can I can maybe let Dwight fill in where I'm, I'm likely going to be missing something. So I, I, I will say that w- once we start doing in-person instruction, things are gonna change. It's gonna be much more dynamic in the classroom for our instructors. So when you're in front of a Zoom, you're real tight to that computer screen. Um, you're sharing things that are on your computer. You're directly connected with the interface, the microphone, uh, the, the, the view of the teacher, the sounds that are happening in the classroom. That since the proximity is really narrowly focused on the exchange through the computer, the, the, the quality of what people are experiencing, while again, the education may be a little different in person uh, versus virtual, as far as the actual engagement, what you can see and experience, it's far different than all of a sudden, if a teacher's in a classroom, they're walking around the classroom, they're using a document camera, they're potentially using the, um, uh, their, um, you know, the, the, the smart board, uh, or, or maybe, you know, walking around in between students there. So there are microphone and camera issues that come in and there's a toggling that needs to take place in the display of information that's going on. The, the dynamic nature of that environment, uh, it just makes it a little bit more difficult. And I, I, Dwight, I don't know if I captured that correctly. I'm trying to just <laughs> recapture some of the things that we had talked about. So it, could, could you potentially, could you add to that a little bit and maybe expand on that? Well, can't the camera and the microphones just still be on as the teacher is in the classroom and instructing just like they're they're videotaping? Or I guess I don't understand. So, Mark, yeah, yes to everything that you've mentioned so far. But one thing to just consider, um, Lori, is just as right now, we're all sitting in front of our laptops. That's how you're seeing me here. And imagine that this was a regular classroom setting. Well, there are going to be, let's say, however many are there, 10 other students who are face-to-face or 20, whatever the number may be. Myself as the teacher, at some point in time, I'm going to have to get up from this seat and go help those students. Um, Is it possible to live stream what's happening in class from the teacher's perspective at home? The, the, The technical answer to that is yes, we absolutely could. The follow-up to that would be, what is that experience like for that student at home that is the consumer? Because it will not look the way that most people would envision it in their mind, where they're envisioning like, well, there's probably a camera in the room. We can see the whole room. Maybe we can see the teacher too. I don't know if you've ever um, actually had the opportunity to view a camera set up in a classroom where someone's writing on a whiteboard. One, it, it depends on the quality of that camera and whether or not that camera will just wash that image out and you won't be able to read it. Then there is our, our teachers in the classroom use the clever touch boards and most people have tried to take their phones, for example, and take a picture of a flat screen TV. You notice you get all the lines in the picture. It's not a clear image because that camera's capturing the refresh rate of that device. So. Is it, can it technically be set up? Yes. Do we feel at this time that that would be a quality experience for the student who's at home as the consumer? Um, Not necessarily. And then on top of that, the teacher then is placed in a position where they are wearing multiple hats at the same time. When we're just in in a virtual environment like I am right now, if Nicole messages me or she starts talking and I'm the teacher and we're all virtual, I can quickly help her it's just a part of this, it, it's organic, a part of, it, organically a part of this experience that I would have to do some tech troubleshooting with one of you as my students in this environment. Now for a teacher who's managing, uh, let's just say 15 students in person, they would have to manage the 15 in addition to supporting the students who are remote, who are, you know, you can't just leave them out on an island. So if um, someone's at home and they have a question or they're having tech issues, it could just be a lot for the teacher to manage, not to say that they couldn't, but it's just level setting for what that expectation would be for that student at home. 
We just really want everyone to have the best experience. But Mark has already given the directive to investigate all of these things. So if this is a direction that um, as a board and as a district we wanted to go, we have the technical infrastructure prepared and in place to offer that. It's just, again, everybody understanding what that experience will look like at home. You know, it's crazy that this is part of our, our yeah, new it's, norm, you know, and that maybe we just have to be smarter about it. I, I don't know, but I was just hoping that we didn't have to reinvent the wheel by having two separate right. programs, you know, that, that a teacher didn't have to do two separate things or create two separate mm -hmm. lesson plans or that it could all be kind yeah. of seamless, but I, I do not understand the technology. I won't ever pretend to understand the technology. And you did clarify a few things, but I'm just hoping that it's something we can continually explore and, and perhaps mm -hmm. tweak and adjust to maybe get it where it's a little bit more seamless and, and effective. Yeah, and, that, and that's what we're exploring right now. How, how, how can we make that ex experience, you know, again, for, for the teacher, is there a way to smooth out, you said seamless, is there a way to smooth out the rough spots right now so that that seam, you know, is just smoother? Um, and so we're trying to explore that. And, I, you know, later in the, I have a bullet point later on, I won't talk about that now, but um, that, that's what we're kind of committed to working with our, with, with our teachers on. What, what things do we need to have in place with our current infrastructure? And then also think about, well, are there, are there additional um, uh, uh, tools that are available to us that we can think about introducing to the environment that might make it easier? Uh, and so that, that's kind of the explorative piece right now. Uh, given what we currently have, okay, here's how it works. And I think, you know, um, uh, Dwight, Dwight's done a great job kind of characterizing for me where I can understand why there are, yeah, it could work, but there are these limitations that are pretty significant that we need to be transparent about, but yet also saying, okay, well, maybe an option here, maybe this option would be, we could leverage those and make it easier for people. So that's what we're trying to determine right now, what tools we may need in order to make this experience better to do exactly what you're saying. How can these seams be smooth so it's just not so rough uh, trying to navigate two environments at the same time. Okay, thank you both. Thank you. Uh, thanks. So um, just mo uh, moving on. So I, I shared earlier, we were thinking about, you know, potentially then moving on to, you know, other students. Again, it would depend on, you know, where we're at statistically, as we talked about earlier. Uh, I just want to confirm with everyone, our school calendar, our first day of school is Monday the 31st. Uh, and our kindergarten students are going to start on that on that uh, same day, and they're going to have half days all week for virtual assessments just to uh, be able to set some baseline data data with our youngest learners. So that's going to take place that week. Um, and, and again, later on, that's the bullet point there about the live streaming. So I'll skip that for now since we talked about it. Um, and then uh, finally, I, I wanted to mention childcare and some options, and I apologize, this one's marked return to school update six. I didn't change it to seven when I finished this last slide. So um, our director of family engagement and communications, Ann Crone, has reached out to the YMCA, Franklin Athletic Club, and Life, uh, Lifetime, uh, and is, is potentially gonna expand to other community partners. So right now, our discussions with the YMCA, we're, we're, we're collaborating with them on potentially bringing a Y Learning Center Day um, to the Birmingham location. And actually she was uh, working with someone at the YMCA today and exchanged some communications. And I wanted to put this quote in there from the email, the Birmingham location is on our potential list of sites to run this program and we hope to do so. So we're gonna try to, our, our goal there, uh, and said she wants to wrap that up here as soon as possible so we can get some information out to our families. Discussions with the Franklin Athletic Club, they've talked about a guided, uh, guided learning camp that would be available to families. Uh, and I, I wanted to put, I didn't have a cost estimate in for the YMCA, but they've, they've kind of put a, uh, this general number around 200 to $250 a week for participants. Uh, uh, and, um, and that's something that um, we're thinking about maybe taking that model and seeing if Lifetime or there's some other opportunities for childcare that we can make available to, um, uh, to parents. And I, I did want to be transparent. There are capacity and space issues. Everyone is, everyone right now from a childcare standpoint is concerned about social distancing and you know all of the requirements, the same thing that schools are faced with. 
Uh, and so I know that there are capacity and space issues, but uh, you know, Anne is committed to working with working with our partners to to uh, to see if these or, or other options might be available for our you know for our families. So uh, with that, I can I can stop. I have one more slide. I, I was asked by a trustee uh, today to just share some information and update on on the House and Senate bill that was approved this past weekend, and I just bulleted out a summary of that on my next slide. And so I'll 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 stop here and, Wait, Mark, and see. Mark, can yes. I back you up? I'm sorry. You know what I did? I Absolutely. Clicked the, I clicked the wrong button and I didn't unmute myself. So I just wanted to back you up on the on the um, slide that showed child care. So I'm wondering, thinking out loud, isn't it possible, could we use our own buildings for childcare options and not have to outsource and then perhaps utilize our CSOs because they've always created the kids club and the latchkey programs before school, after school. And they've been um, very creative doing the 7 a.m to the later 6 p.m. and maybe keeping the cost down for families. Is that something we can explore? Yeah, we, we've, we, in fact, I, I talked to Ann about that today. We've talked about that several times. Um, there, there are a couple of things that we're juggling right now. Number one, the same, uh, as I said earlier, the same constraints that limit us with respect to bringing, you know, bringing our students back for education are also, um, are also, you know, they also come into play with respect to child care. Um, secondly, with respect to our, you know, bringing our teachers in the building and asking them to, uh, to you know, work from their work from their classrooms, you know, our, our, our goal there too, while we've got our, our staff in and we're trying to make sure that our, our building is, is clean and sanitized, you know, it, it introduces some other elements. It's not that we can't explore them. Uh, uh, but I think that those are things that we, you know, we need to think about as well, how, how it is that we, we've got staff in the building and then we're introducing, you know, more staff and more students in an environment where we said, look, we're uncomfortable with that right now. Uh, we just need to think through that. So it, it is, it is a possibility. I do know that, um, uh, uh, for example, I think the, the, the YMCA in Farmington, I know, I know, uh, trustee Hochmer knows about this for sure. You know, they, they, so if Farmington relies on their YMCA to run their childcare uh, program, essentially, it's, 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 it's done uh, through that partnership. So the Y is running it. And I know that they're, they're thinking about, uh, if not, they, they have a plan in place to do that. So it's something that Ann and I talked about. Um, it, it's a possibility. Um, and, um, it, and so, I, like I said, it's something that we're thinking about right now. The final thing that I want to say is, I do know that staffing is going to be an issue. Um, and we we did have we did have some issues with staff uh, with respect to our our kids club program number of staff being incredibly concerned with respect to our implementation of the hybrid program and that we would still have childcare available we did lose some supervisors associated with that program just out of concern that um, that any in person environment would be concerning to them uh, and so I, again I'm not saying that we're we, we're uh, we're close to it entirely, but those are those are factors right now that are that are on our mind with respect to running a uh, you know a child care program in our facilities. Uh, you know when we have uh, teachers present at the same time. Um, okay, uh, I would just facilities like and staff that stay open. You know that exploration because I'm looking at the price, the cost, and you know that's a thousand dollars a month. And when people are, you know, furloughed still or um, had to give up 20, 30% of their salary, I, I just get very worried. So I'd like to keep that avenue open to exploration and, and maybe somehow try to see if we can bring the cost down and be creative in utilizing space and above all, keeping safety first. I mean, I'm keenly aware of that. Yeah. But I just wanted to mention that. So thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Hey, Mark. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. I, I love Lori's idea. The only problem is I was just wondering about the liability of it all. You know, the liability of it all. Uh, you you bring up a good point. You know, I, I think as long as we're following the recommendations that are that are part of the roadmap and the requirements, I, from a liability standpoint, I, I think we're in good shape, right? We can't, 
you know, there are obligations that we have. We need to make sure we're following through on those. I, I do know that I've had some conversations with Ann too, as well uh, about you know, our licensing requirements with respect to running a daycare during the daytime. Um, and, and again, these are just things that we would need to explore as, as uh, you know, Trustee Ashley said as well, you know, we're, we're, we're open to taking a look at these. We wanna uh, engage these relationships with community partners. Um, our, our priority is making sure that this virtual environment is launched and as successful as it possibly can be, while at the same time, you know, trying to think about options, uh, you know, for our own staff uh, to to uh, to potentially work with kids in that environment uh, and have things here in the building. So, uh, so we're we're definitely going to continue to explore. And, and I know I need to stop talking. I'll finish this and I'll turn this off. I need to put the PowerPoint down. Um, no, Mark. I, Thank you. Okay. Yep. Yep. So I, I just wanted to talk about the highlights. So on Saturday, the Senate voted on a compromise bill. Um, it's a return to school bill uh, for the state of Michigan. The House voted uh, on Monday and approved it. It's, it's going to the governor's desk. I don't know if it's been signed already, but I wanted to share some of the highlights of that with respect to requirements for us. So it's going to require recertification of the 2020-2021 learning plans every 30 days. And so there'll be a resolution before the board every month at our regular meeting uh, in order to kind of re recommit to whatever learning plan that we have in place at, at, at that particular time. Uh, the benchmark assessments we talked about, um, it, this, this, the third point here with the pupil count, this, is, this does provide, um, it, it's not the full request that, that a lot of districts were asking for. We were asking for a hold harmless provision where we could use last year's pupil count, but um, the pupil count for this year, our state funding is going to be based on a 75-25 blend with 75% being last year's pupil count and 25% being this year's pupil count. Um, and virtual students will count on that. We have an assurance uh, change in the School Aid Act that our virtual our students and virtual students, which all of them for us, are going to count. Uh, it clarified the virtual attendance requirement. Um, there's no information about our annual funding level. That's going to come later on. Uh, uh, it does require each Board of Education to establish edu um, education goals for the district uh, by the 15th of September. Those need to be published um, and um, uh, by, uh, by October 1st. Uh, it does require us to collaborate with the Health Department. Um, I find that uh, particular uh, requirement interesting. We have been collaborating with the health department. Um, I, I don't think that our willingness to collaborate is the issue, but nonetheless, there's a requirement that we do that. We're committed to doing that anyway. Our, our, our formal kindergarten readiness assessments that were state mandated are not required. As I shared earlier, though, we are going to do those baseline assessments uh, for our students as they come in. And this did provide no additional clarity with respect to our school start criteria. So it permitted, it, it just commit, uh, com, um, confirm the ability to do virtual learning, but uh, there's no additional clarity behind this. So I know there were a lot of comments that came out in the press about this being a, a great compromise that provided clarity to school districts. It did with some things. As far as our actual return method or framework, um, it didn't provide any additional information. So uh, those are the highlights from that. Uh, we will get a breakdown of this bill once it's signed. Um, from our from our legal counsel, as we do all of these bills and executive orders, though I'm sure there will be details here that we don't have captured on the slide. And when we have those, we'll share those with the board. And, and if there are any requirements incumbent upon the school district, we'll make sure that we meet those. Um, hey, Mark, can I just add that one of the uh, features of, I, I think it was the last bill, is that um, we do need to they've requested that we prioritize um, K through five when we do begin our phased in plan for instruction, face-to-face -face instruction. Yes, thank you. Mark, do you foresee um, accounting for the face, I mean, the um, interactions with children twice a week being a problem? You know, I, I personally don't think so. Um, and, and again, this is where this is where Schoology is going to help us a great deal. So there are tools within that program where teachers can facilitate um, um, kind of like a message board or group chats with students. And so teachers can post something, 
students can respond. And so, you know, we just, we need that teacher, that two way it's going from the teacher to the student and the student back to the teacher. So I think keeping up with that on a regular basis, um, I, and I have mixed, I've mixed, I've, I've seen two different reports on this. It's, I saw one, uh, one summary of this bill and said it needed to take place weekly. I saw something else somewhere that it said it needed to take place monthly from a pupil accounting standpoint. I, I we'll, we'll get clarification on this. We'll be okay. I, I I think I think we'll be fine. We'll have to be diligent, right? This is because of the virtual environment. This is a new way to account for pupils, and we'll need to make sure that that everyone's attention uh, is 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 focused on making sure we satisfy this requirement. But I I, I believe we'll be okay. Okay, thanks. I was gonna say face to face, but I remembered it wasn't face to face. It was interface. <laughs> is the yes. word that they use. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I also wanted to get clarification on one more point. So looking at our, our most vulnerable population and we're using a virtual setting, a, a virtual platform is not going to meet their needs. Are these kids going to be allowed in a face-to-face -face environment at least you know, maybe twice a week, small groups, using all of the safety measures we have in place and um, providing them with the instruction they need? Are we going to so, have them come back? I mean, so, this is an important question that I've probably heard from, I, I don't know how many parents, quite a yeah, few. So so we need we need a plan for that, right? So I that and that's that's our commitment to do that. So okay. right now okay. we're in an all yeah right now we're in an all virtual environment and uh, and I'll share with you exactly what I shared with with our our PAC parents this morning in the meeting with them. Um, I said this is something we know that is as you stated our most challenged learners you know need need in person. Um, right now again the the way things were were heading with our with our plan. <laughs> Um, you know, there, there are some considerations that we needed to make. We decided we're going to go all virtual as a structure for all of K-12. We'll get our virtual environment implemented. And then, then as soon as we can start discussions with, with our staff about what systems can we put in place for one-on-one -on -one in small groups. That'll be the first priority. And then per particularly there, there could be some specialized learners where we're, we're thinking about that. So definitely I'm committed to exploring those. And I think we also need to think about are there additional, are there additional safety considerations that we need to, uh, uh, okay. need, need to keep in mind. And so we have a commitment right now to explore that uh, you know, with our teachers, no matter what we do, as I said earlier, it's gotta be system-wide. We can't have, we can't have something for one building and not another. So uh, we're, we're committed to exploring that. And I'm, and I'm hopeful also we'll start this health advisory group We'll, we'll, we'll get some um, additional um, expertise coming to the table from our parents who have experience in the field. And I'm hoping we can combine, combine that with our, um, you know, with those conversations we have after we start this environment. And hopefully those will put us, you know, point us in the right direction of, of being able to consider that implementation at some point in time uh, here soon after the school year starts. Trustees, anything else? Ooh. It's only 924. <laughs> okay, thank you, Mark, um, for those two very, very, very important updates. Um, I appreciate it. Um, before we dive into the next piece of which is board comments and requests, I just wanna check in with everybody. This is the Birmingham Public School Board of Education, our regular meeting for Tuesday, August 18th, 2020. We are now on agenda item G, which is board comments and requests. Trustees, I will open it to see if anyone has anything um, that they'd like to present or say. President Whitman, I just have two things from the Birmingham Education Foundation. Sure, please. Um, we They did a um, fundraiser and we have 310 incoming kindergarten families who took advantage of the Future Falcon or Future Maple program. So they'll all receive um, signs for their front lawn that say Future Falcon or Future Maple, as well as a t-shirt. Um, so thank you to those community members who participated. And right now, we um, the BEF is running a 
literacy program for elementary school teachers um, to fund licenses for supplemental literacy curriculum. So there's 157 elementary school teachers and it's our, the goal of the BEF to fund um, a virtual license for each teacher. So that is um, something that's ongoing. And if people want more information, they can go to the BEF website. Thank you, Secretary Rass. Anything else? Nope. Well, okay. I just wanted to acknowledge one of our students. I don't know if I can say what, what she's doing, but we have a student who's an alum in our district who's taking a national stage tonight. And um, I think it speaks to the types of students that we produce out of our district. So I just wanted to acknowledge that it's a proud moment for us. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Mari Manugian, I should say. There you go. I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? No? Okay, we will move on then to public communication. I will turn it over to uh, Secretary Rass. As I mentioned, we have eight public comment submissions for this evening. Go ahead, Trustee Rass. Thank you. The first public comment is from Claire Heller. Dear Board members and superintendent, my name is Claire Heller and I am incoming eighth grade student at Berkshire Middle School. I wanted to say that I was very disappointed at how last week's board meeting went. And I strongly disagree with the decision not to return to school in person. I watched the whole board meeting on August 11th, 2020. And I know I wasn't the only person who saw how the majority of the board's members ignored the public comments from parents and students in favor of returning to the buildings. The superintendent's hybrid plan was met with doubt from people who are scared. I think he allowed the scare to make the decision for him. But this decision is not about you. It's about my classmates and I receiving an education. If you do end up ignoring all parents and students hoping to return to school, at least make online schooling the best online schooling ever. Convince me that you have my best interest in mind while forcing me and my peers to receive a virtual education. Another thing I would like to add would be that in November, when we might return to school, the cases will most likely rise due to the amount of time spent inside. So we might not be able to get back to school in November. How do I know the superintendent will do everything he can so I can return to school when we reach November? If he does not present you with a plan for a return in November, how do I know that you will approve it? When do you need to, what do you need to see so I can meet my teachers and my classmates face-to-face -face next year? I feel the best choice for my fellow classmates and I is to return to school on August 31st, 2020. Um, the second public comment is from Luisa and Juan Aguido. To the BPS Central Leadership Team and Board of Education, it is, my, it is with sincere hope that we wish you take these recommendations under serious consideration as you finalize the BPS action plan for the education of Birmingham school community children. You need not know our personal view or preference on the educational path we have chosen for our children. For you see I speak on behalf of any parent or child in the community who have for the last few weeks painstakingly considered both options laid before us and then chosen either virtual or hybrid curriculum and laid that path out for their children. This letter is instead regarding the caliber of education that is expected of the Birmingham school public schools and the cautious nature of which you must act in the months ahead. The departure from both the online and virtual programs with the tools from the state of Michigan and the hybrid program only three weeks before the start of the school year is illustrative of both poor leadership and has set up our educational community up for failure. A robust program was promised yet and recent late actions do not provide adequate time to put such program in place. There is an unrealistic amount of planning for leaders of our schools and teacher preparation, including training, to ensure that they're fully prepared for children to enter the virtual classrooms. And it's with this in mind that I implore you to delay the start of the school year and enable the educators who are with our children every day to make decisions that in the best interest of their children without significant oversight and intervention. It is time to stand aside in in addition, as you embark on the school year and continue to have conversations about what a safe return to school looks like, it's critical to acknowledge that these conversations should not take place without the engagement of health experts. 
Educational wellness is both mind and body. And up to this point in time, the latter of the two has been lacking as it's clear in both BPS's inability and to effectively answer health-related questions submitted by our community and its inability to establish a proactive plan for the COVID-19 exposure or diagnosis. I would argue to say that most schools in America have this gap and it is at time like this that calls for change in thinking and how we approach our educational communities. It is with this in mind that we strongly recommend the establishment of a, of a health board or committee of health leaders specifically serving the BPS community. These would be leaders with whom you would make cooperative and informed decisions about how our school communities will both operate in near and long term. BPS has long known as a leading educational establishment in the state of Michigan and our immediate community, and it's time to walk ahead and lead us all in the new direction. Be an educational innovator in the state of Michigan and make a mark. Do not stand behind the status quo. Step ahead of the pack. Best regards, Louisa and Juan Edgado. Uh, Public comment number three, Alfred Gade. When will the superintendent open the Birmingham Public Schools for face-to-face -face learning? I suspect November 4th should he get the right election results. This is a political decision and you are badly using our children for the Michigan governor's political purposes. Leave our children and grandchildren out of your unconvincing political decision-making. Neither your advisors nor you and your governor opinions make logical sense as not opening will have a greater adverse results than to have opened. You have not convinced us that online learning is any kind of substitute. Alfred Gade. Public comment number four, are not in Aaron Heller, Matthew and Catherine Heller. Dear board of members and Superintendent Dajiak and the BPS central leadership. The board meeting on Tuesday, August 11th, 2020 provided stark examples of lack of leadership at the Board of Education and the role of the superintendent. The board members praise central leadership for providing a results that over 60% of the community does not support and that the board agrees creates an education gap. Failure to address this leadership gap will result in further delays to provide any form of education, whether it be in person or online. It is obvious that a plan that was agreed upon on August 4th, 2020, which provided the community a choice between an in-person hybrid or an all virtual academy was met with criticism by both parents and BPS staff members. The board's unwillingness to address these concerns and led them through is concerning. Leaders must make hard decisions. This virus is not going away anytime soon and your failure, failure to address concerns in the community will only make your jobs harder as we head into fall. If you are not up for the task, you must remove yourself from the situation. You are not allowed to quit. You are not allowed to fail. This community is not interested in excuses or inaction, which are prevalent in the board meeting. We expect more. If you are unable to deliver results, you should resign immediately. If you do not resign, we expect that you do not use inaction as an excuse and then ask for forgiveness. BPS staff, Rumors surrounded the communication of your plan to your staff members. The superintendent's inability to lead his team should provide great pause in the board's decision to support him. If he cannot lead, how will we execute on the wishes of the community? What assurance do you have that the current plan will be successful? Currently, you were unable to produce a product in the spring and unable to agree on a product which the community for the which with the community for the fall. At our company, if a if our staff would not return to work, we would ask what do the conditions need for you to be to return. Then we would work tighter listly to provide those conditions. We would not ask a single member to return until we had everything in place, but we would provide the steps forward and work as a team in order to achieve the results. Your team is sacred and rightfully, your team is scared and rightfully so. You have failed to provide them with the plan that adequately addresses their concerns while providing the community the educational product they are requesting. BPS board, it was obvious from your meeting that you had no answer to the community whether they were for or against the proposal. You all read pre-authored statements. How are you talking, taking into account your constituents and their reading statements that you had written? The optics were terrible. Trustee McKinney provided the only statement against the proposal and none of you asked a single question. Do you listen to each other? Were you even interested in her point of view? You will not be able to provide an acceptable product without some type of discussion and problem solving. Does the board ever engage in this thinking? You are failing to make data-driven decisions. Your decisions are completely based on emotion. Trustee, Dan, your time is up. 
Thank you, Trustee Hokemer. Um, the fifth public comment is from Deanna England, Dear Birmingham Board. Please reconsider a part-time in-person option for students. There are multiple aspects that the fully virtual solution does not consider. One, our community is already using more than 80% of available bandwidth. Unless we improve our infrastructure, there will be intermittent outages for students and teachers, which will significantly impact the effectiveness of synchronous sessions. Two, infection rates and statistics show that with proper precautions, the virus poses low risk for children and there is lack of evidence of spread from children to adults. Three, the virtual option does not address the social emotional needs of students. Four, at-risk students will suffer the most with lack of resources and lack of visibility. Five, we have been able to prevent the spread of in our factories and businesses. Why are we not learning from them? Six, spring proved that many teachers are uncomfortable and or incapable of teaching virtually. Seven, large numbers of families are shifting to private schools to ensure a face-to-face -face learning environment. We will see a large exodus this year and may not, may or may not see a huge influx once this is over. I can tell you that my kids are craving interaction with their teachers and classmates and are seriously upset that the option had been taken away. Thank you for your consideration. Kind regards, Deanna England with students at Berkshire and Groves. Public comment number six from Mary Chalam. BPS School Board, I applaud the action taken by our superintendent last week to begin our school year online. I chose the virtual option for my children because I believe it is simply not necessary to send our children to school right now. The risk is too great for children, teachers, staff, and parents. Schools will not be able to provide safe social distancing for our children in classrooms and hallways. In reality, it is easier to social distance in an office than a school. Although I believe traditional Classroom learning is the best option. It is not the safest option right now. It is my hope that all students participating in the same online program will create a cohesive learning environment, help to build a stronger educational program, and result in a positive learning experience. Thank you for your attention to this serious matter. Mary Chalam. Public comment number seven is from Greg Batra and Susie Bai. Dear PPS Superintendent, Central Leadership Team, and Trustees, we represent the Parent Advisory Committee, which meets regularly with the administration specifically to look at the needs of our students with IEPs. And indeed, we are, had a very informative meeting this morning. We appreciate the district support for our most vulnerable learners, many of whom failed to progress or even regress this past spring. Our administration is clearly problem solving in a dynamic way to try to begin safely meeting in person with the most needful students as soon as possible. We want to continue to emphasize that students with IEPs and 504s are some of the most disadvantaged by learning within a virtual environment and call on the administration to look for ways to provide one-on-one -on -one services and therapies as soon as possible. Educational services to be provided in person for families that choose that option. Our children in the self-contained classrooms, especially for autism, cognitive and emotional impairment will have the most difficult time with the virtual platform. While we wish and administration was able to provide us with more concrete details and deadlines about this process. We are looking forward to learning about their decisions as soon as possible. We hope to work together with the administration and the parents we represent to help all our kids get the resources they need. We encourage the administration and board to communicate clearly and often with parents about the new systems being put in place, the services and supports being offered, and the plans for future return to in-person schooling. We expect that the district will implement any changes to IEP services quickly so that school doesn't get too far in without plans in place for all our learners. Sincerely, Greg Butra and PAC Chair Susie Bai, PAC Vice Chair. Public comment number eight, Bob Saad, BPS Board. Many thanks for your hard work and voluntary service to our community. After seeing the personnel report this month, I would like to express my sincerest congratulations to Frad Mershman, on her retirement for over 34 years of service to the BPS community. As I believe we can all agree, Fran is just fabu a fabulous person and has been a wonderful asset to our district in her various roles. And specifically, she was clearly a stabilizing and foundational support for the administration office in her most recent years. I'm truly am sad to see Fran leave, but I also wish her the greatest of joys and successes in the next chapter of her life. Best regards, Bob said. That concludes public comment. Thank you, Secretary Rass. Um, going next to general consent agenda, uh, the only thing we have, um, ironically, is our regular personnel report for the month. 
and as our um, input, or excuse me, as our community um, letter said from Mr. Bob Saad, um, one of the line items on that is bittersweet for us is Freyon Mershman did decide to retire after 34 plus years of service. And given this crazy COVID, I know we all feel very bad that we weren't able to send her off with some sort of party cupcakes, um, just giving her a big hug. So thanks, Bob, for bringing that up. And again, even though it's going under a general consent agenda, I feel the need to at least say, Fran, congratulations. We miss you and best of luck. And she's probably not even watching this, but it's all still okay. Um, so trustees, is there a motion? Do we approve consent agenda? So moved. All those, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay, the consent agenda passes. Uh, now we're gonna jump down to agenda item L, which is under business services, the reports and resolutions. We have two resolutions this evening, as I mentioned, to pass. The first is resolution number 18, the selection of a construction manager. As trustees, you'll remember, we did discuss this at last Tuesday, the 8th, August 11th study session, which took place after our special meeting. Uh, Mark, I'm not sure, do you want me to turn it over to you or Jim? I know Scott's here. Hi, Scott. Thanks for hanging in there. Everyone. Yeah, Scott, Scott, I think will pr probably, in case anybody didn't uh, tune in last time and uh, for the public, just provide a, a quick overview about that. And Jim, if there's anything you want to say here, introduce Scott. We uh, were, were uh, in the process of selecting construction <clears throat> managers for our for the uh, for the most recent bond, uh, and they can talk about the process and where we're at with the two selections. Yep. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, well, we, we know Scott Scott is with Plant Moran Cressa. We went through a process similar to the architects to select the construction manager. We had a lot of participation through uh, you know staff administration. Um, and we, it was a process that was vetted that um, had a, a lot with the interview process. So we feel comfortable with the two construction managers that we picked. They were unanimous selections. And with that, I'll turn over to Scott to provide more details. Yeah, uh, thanks, Jim. I think you said a lot of things well. Good evening, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be a part of the, the, the agenda tonight. A lot of good discussion, uh, very informative. Uh, from my perspective, so thank you for that. Um, jumping into the construction managers, yes, it's a it's a very similar process that we went through with the architects back in June with their recommendation. And, and since we've awarded contracts to them, they've been busy with us meeting, uh, you know, planning the work for the coming uh, year and, and years even beyond. Um, so now it's time to bring the construction manager on. Probably the the last really big piece of the of the puzzle, I would say, as far as the the team goes um, for the bond work. And so um, really back in, even before June, we started planning for this. And um, in early June, we put the RFP out, we did advertise it publicly. Um, so anybody that was interested and could meet certain criteria could uh, be a part of the process and be um, you know, invited to uh, solicit or uh, submit a proposal for the work. Um, we had a pre-bid meeting. We had, I think roughly 20 folks uh, in attendance, so it was well uh, well received. We had a lot of uh, participation from some of the, the biggest firms here, um, not only in Michigan, but also uh, regionally as well. Um, uh, back in June uh, the 30th, we, we actually got eight proposals from different firms. Eight, eight of the firms proposed on uh, project one, which is really our elementary and middle school program, and program two being the high school, Midvale uh, annex building, uh, that'd be program two, so we had six, I'm sorry, we had eight proposals on program two, which was the high schools, which is um, a little bit bigger in terms of value. And we had six proposals on the um, elementary middle school program. Um, we used a criteria-based uh, selection similar to the architects that we developed with the district to determine, you know, what are the real priorities here? You know, obviously cost is important, but what other things make a great uh, construction manager and, and, a, and a great fit for the district? Um, so we, we used the, the proposals to kind of Whittle that those proposals down to really three, three finalists that we interviewed on uh, July the 14th. And as Jim mentioned, we had uh, great participation from the district, a lot of interest to, to meet some of these firms and see what their capabilities are. Um, uh, so I want to thank those uh, everybody for, for their time. I think it's well 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 used, and I think it will serve you well 
um, you know, as we get into the specific buildings. But um, shortly after that, we, we kind of used the uh, interview scores that were derived from the district and uh, kind of input that into the matrix, if you will. And uh, um, so we came down with two firms. It really was a unanimous choice. We reviewed these uh, with the central leadership team at a meeting shortly thereafter. And uh, so um, as we went through last week, we're really recommending two firms tonight for construction managers. Um, for uh, project one, that's gonna be Rockford Construction. And uh, I guess I could read the numbers here uh, for, the, um, for the official tally, but um, Rockford Construction, we're recommending them in the amount of uh, $2,349,994. So that's gonna be their fee and their staffing and uh, what we're doing with the general conditions, which are the reimbursables. We'll award those at a later date once we have a better understanding of what's really required with each project and what the parameters are. Um, you know, there may be some things that are project specific that you really can't uh, determine at the, at the point of an RFP. Um, so those will be awarded later. Um, for program two, uh, we're recommending Barton Mallow uh, Builders uh, for the high school at Midvale and Annex work. And that amount is 4 million. $866,004. Again, um, similar setup as uh, program two. Um, we've been in contact with these firms. Uh, we've been working behind the scenes, uh, negotiating uh, some of the contract details. So um, we're pleased to present the recommendations to you. We feel like we have agreement in principle on all this stuff. And uh, these guys are ready to hit the ground running with your approval. And uh, I guess at this point, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Jim and Mark if there are any questions. Thanks, Scott. Trustee, do I have a motion for resolution 18, the contract for the construction manager? So moved. Oh, no. Second. Trustees, any discussion or questions for Scott and or Jim? Kim, can I ask I one have question? A oh, go ahead, Brian. I apologize. Kim, I do I have, I have one question. Where's okay. Rockford out of? What city is, is Rockford out of? They're on the west side of the state, Grand Rapids, right, Scott? They're headquartered on Grand Rapids. They have a local office here in Detroit. I'm sorry, guys. I apologize. I, I know Barton Marlowe. I mean, they just do work all over the place, and they're they're very good. I just I just I, Rockford Construction. I just hadn't heard of, but they're on the west side of the state, correct? Yes. Yep, they do about 400 plus million dollars per year. So uh, they are a large firm. Uh, they do do a lot of work, uh, really even over here in Southeast Michigan as well. Sorry about that. You said $2.1 million for Rockford? Is that correct? Oh, the contract amount? Yeah, 2.1? No, two it's not. Two, three. Yeah. Two, three. Two, three, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Thank you sure. so much. Nicole, do you have a question? My question was more about, um, are there projects that we should focus on now that schools are closed that we could be getting started or getting done or does that even matter at this point? Um, you know that um, ironically with the football season moving to spring, it actually, um, possibly will delay some of the work that we had planned at Grove Stadium, uh, just because we had planned to start the work, you know, sometime in April, May, I believe the football season is going to start in March and end in May. So it's probably going to delay some of that work. Uh, we, uh, we did go over some of the projects that we have planned in uh, the study session. So we'll still be doing some work there, but probably not as robust as what we had first planned uh, because if we're going through May with the football season, anticipate a start in August with a football season, it really doesn't give us a lot of time to uh, get that project going. But the one thing that I will say that we're going to do, we're going to move that maintenance garage. <laughs> that is top priority. Hey, Jim Burton Marlowe is 4.2. Yes. 4.8. Oh, 4.8, okay. Why, why am I writing things down wrong? It's 4.8? Okay, yeah, thank four, you. It's in the, yeah, 4.8, fix it. 
and four dollars. Um, We're roughly yeah. seven point two million between the two. And you know, the other thing I forgot to mention: again, we received a lot of good turnout. You know, we had proposals from different ways, people staffing it differently, different fees uh, percentage wise. You know, we're, we're happy to report similar to the architects, we're, we're about a million dollars under our, what our budget is. And, and we're not over inflating that. We'll, we'll, we, we've saved, saved some money and set some money aside for these reimbursables that we have to determine. Um, so we really feel good about that. We're, you know, now we're about $2 million to the good after um, a word of, uh, of the uh, construction managers and the architects. So again, uh, a really good climate, a lot of great interest uh, from some really good firms. Uh, a lot of people that wanted to be a, a uh, to join the team. Uh, unfortunately, there you know there's only room for two, uh, but we feel like we got two really good firms that are uh, anxious and excited to be a part of it. Seth, so I have kind of a, just a random question with regard to last week. Bloomfield Hills passed their bond, so they're obviously now getting all their plans together. Do, 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 I guess do we bake anything into our contracts with anybody? To make sure that we're not um, that we're not either getting left behind, or now that there's another person looking for the same services that's so close to our backyard. I mean, how do we make sure that we because we I mean, we approved our bond quite some months ago, so we were ready to go. Yep, we uh, we got there first, right? Um, sure. There is some language, you know, that that basically we you know this is the team; these are the people that were part of the interview process. You know, we've been assured that they're committed to the program. Um, you know, anything's possible, but, you know, if anything were to occur, then, you know, the, really the district, there's a process to, you, you can't just take someone out, you know, there's a reason this team was selected is you know, that was part of the criteria. Who, who's the team? You know, what's the experience? And, and a lot of these folks were just coming actually out of the Troy district. Um, and, and we've worked with them uh, on, on previous bonds very successfully as well from Bartonella. So, um, you know, these people could easily go to some other firm, you know, next week. It's, it's pretty hot in the construction industry, but uh, these, these, this particular team from Barton Mallow has been with the firm for a long time. I, I think they're well vested. I, I won't put words in anybody's mouth, but, um, you know, I, I feel good about it. And they, they've committed the, the resources to us as well, at least for the critical players anyway. Good. Okay. A very good point. Trustees, any other questions before we call it to vote? No? Okay. All those in favor of resolution 18, the selection of the construction manager, please say aye. 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 All aye. those opposed? Okay. Resolution 18 passes seven to zero. Moving to our last resolution to vote on the National School Breakfast Program. Um, this is an annual uh, resolution that we do pass. Mark, I'll turn it over to you if you want to tee it up or, do, or is it to you, Jim? Yeah, just to Jim. Uh, okay, yeah, he can. He, yeah, he can. He can explain the orientation with this resolution. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, this is a requirement of National School Breakfast Program that to provide flexibility, you have to identify schools that you are not going to serve. This doesn't mean that if we have a need at uh, Beverly Pierce Court or West Maple, that uh, we would we would provide uh, service to a student but we don't have uh, annually a lot of students that um, decide to take the breakfast program in those schools. Uh, past history has shown that uh, it, it really does not, uh, the revenues do not provide, cover the expenses. So again, if a student were uh, in need of a breakfast, all they have to do is talk to the principal and we'll provide individual breakfast, but we don't have a full program at those four schools. And trustees, we put this, we did not, at least we didn't put it on the consent agenda as we could have again, because it's an annual, um, it's an annual vote. However, I know one of the questions that came up um, and why we wanted to pull it out for discussion is since we are not going back physically into classes, Jim, can you explain how they're going to arrange those breakfasts to the community uh -huh. members, please? Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, our food service program will be providing um, breakfast and uh, lunches for five days a week. They will uh, hand out on Thursdays. What we're going to do is prep everything at Groves, and then they will drive to Derby and West Maple to pass out um, the breakfast and lunch for five days. 
And how are we updating the information um, as a result of COVID? I assume that a lot of families' situations have probably changed um, right. since our data yeah. last year. Great question. Um, actually, food service, uh, we, we talked about that last week in our meeting, well, my meeting with food service to uh, arrange the plan going forward. Um, what uh, food service wants to send out a survey and also applications, you know, saying applications are available online um, or at your school because they know that some um, family situations have changed. So uh, we anticipate that there will be a more need going forward. And we certainly want to, um, you know, bring in everybody that would have a need. So uh, we'll reach out to people and really try to um, solicit the, the applications. Uh, Jim, hey, Kim, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Amy. Oh, um, Jim, just question. You said they're passing food out on Thursday. Yes. Yeah. Um, so just out of curiosity is, um, I mean, wouldn't it make more sense to do it on Monday so they have it consistently for those five days or is it um, better? Well, it's po yeah, that's possible, but um, we receive our deliveries on Wednesday. So everything is comes in Wednesday, they unpack it, that way it's fresh and they can hand it out on Thursday instead of holding it until the following Monday, putting it in uh, storage, refrigerated. It, it's basically a you know one night type thing and then we get it into uh, students' hands. Okay, thanks. Trustees, do I have a motion for resolution 19, the National School Black? Hey, Kim, Kim. So moved. I apologize, Kim. That's okay. I'm just let me call right. it and we can talk about we, it. We have vote, we have voted on this um, every year, um, right? Correct. I mean, this is something that we do. This is um, but COVID has changed it a little bit, is that correct? Um not necessarily. It's just that we won't be in person. Um, as far as, um, are you asking from the summer program to the uh, now in-person program? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm glad that you brought that up. I was going to um, talk Thank about that because in the summer, we could provide meals to anybody. Um, now we actually have to have a roster um, and we have to also go down and identify the students that are free or reduced, they get the meals free or I believe 40 cents for a meal. Whereas if we have uh, students that are not free and reduced, they'll have to pay the full price of the meal. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at too is going on online service. So uh, people could do basically do a pre-order. So if they wanted to come in on Thursday, they can say, we're gonna come in Thursday you know, here's my order, then they can, you know, drive through and just say, you know, Larson Scheidler, I'll take my food. So, you know, we're, we're not identifying anybody, we're not singling anybody out, it's just a drive through and you pick it up. So. Okay, so why don't we call, um, so, Trustee Agiluni, Vice President, you motion for resolution number 19. Do I have a I second? Did. I did. Second. Okay, second. Any other questions? Comments? No? Okay, so all those in favor of resolution 19, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, resolution 19 passes 720. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, now to our last section, any announcements or discussion trustees? No, last calendar. Mark, do you wanna say anything or do you want me just to go through my dates that I have? Uh, it just, uh, just to recapture again, our first day of school is Monday, August 31st. Uh, strangest first day of school. Uh, probably in uh, at least modern history for sure. And uh, even given everything, uh, I am excited to get back into uh, as, as close as a, a routine as, as we can. 
I, I, I know that this will be a departure from the spring. I'm excited about that. And the teachers that I've communicated with an email uh, are excited about it as well. They're bound and determined to make this as successful as it possibly can be given all the challenges. So I, I wanted to mention that and also that our teachers are gonna be back next week for, for, for professional learning uh, throughout the entire week. Are you doing any sort of Red Apple Zoom or anything, Mark? Like last? Yes, we are. So we're, we're trying to, we're, we're, um, we are, it's all going to be virtual and we're honestly, we're, we're still trying to, we're starting to details on that. A lot of people on one, on one TV screen. <laughs> yep. um, okay. So for the community and trustees, please look at your calendar because given today's meeting, um, we all feel like we've got a lot of work to do and September is a busy month for us. So for, again, the community and for our calendar purposes, on Tuesday, September 1st, we have our first study session of the month, and that is at 7.30 a.m. On Tuesday, September 8th, we have our second study session of the month, and that is at 6 p.m. Uh, we then, that following, that Saturday, we have a board retreat, Saturday, September 12th, that begins at 9 a.m. And then uh, lastly, in September, Tuesday, September 15th at 7 p.m., we have our regular scheduled meeting for the month. So as of right now, four dates on the calendar and there may be more to come. So um, thank you everyone, it's 10.01. Um, thanks for hanging in there. And again, Mark, thank you for the two very critical, important updates. I'm sure everyone appreciates it. So thanks everyone, have a great night and we are officially adjourned at 10.02. Good night. Hi, everyone.